Let's just say that when it came to curfew attendance in my hometown, I wasn't exactly getting any awards in my youth. I'd been picked up a few times, but all it took was a promise that I'd finally learned my lesson and punishment from my parents for the police to let me off with just a warning. The curfew was that no one under 18 was allowed to be outside after dark unattended between the hours of 10pm and 6am. Kind of a stupid rule if you ask me, because all the best movies had midnight showings at our local theater that almost none of us could go to. We still went anyway of course, but it didn't come without risks if we walked there. Most days, my mom could pick me up and drop me off, but she often worked on the weekends, so if I wanted to see a late night showing, I'd have to brave the walk myself and duck out of sight of any passing marked police cruisers. So let me set the scene. It was 2018 and a horror movie called Hereditary had just come out. Everyone I'd known who'd seen it was raving about it, and that immediately piqued my interest. My girlfriend at the time loved horror movies and being creeped out as much as I did. We made plans to meet up that Saturday night for a technically illegal midnight showing. We were both 16 at the time. The movie theater is squished between the courthouse and a tattoo shop on Main Street. Right across from it is this barren parking lot, illuminated only by the sparse lights peppering the side of the road. Although it's usually bustling during the day, Main Street is absolutely a dead zone for traffic at night. Only a few insomniacs, night shifters, and delinquents like us remain to be seen. My girlfriend Sarah thought that if we cut through the parking lot to get there, we could duck in an alleyway between the tattoo shop and the movie theater if a cop car happened to pass by. Then, on the way home, we could go in between cars to keep from being seen. I thought that was a genius plan, and ultimately that's what we decided to go with. I told my mom I was going to spend the night playing video games with a friend, and she told her father she'd been invited to a slumber party that same night. I can't objectively say how believable we were, but they both decided to let us go anyways. The plan was on. As the sun set on D-Day, I was jittery with excitement. Both with the thrill of seeing the movie, and of spending time with my girlfriend, as well as the idea that we could pull this off. The first couple times I snuck out, I was a bit careless, and got up to some minorly illegal shit. So I was determined not to make any mistakes this time, both for my sake and my mom's. I didn't want to give her a heart attack of having to face a fine because her son got in trouble too many times after all. My mom went to work around 8pm and wouldn't be back until early in the morning. Around 5 or so, Sarah texted me that her dad had already passed out for the evening in front of a football game, so we had some time to kill and prepare for the night. That included grabbing some snacks. I spent a few hours goofing around online until about 10.30. By then, it was time to head out. The night was crisp and chilly. I pulled my hoodie up around my face, already feeling the bite from the wind. The leaves crunched under my feet as I walked through the cul-de-sac where I lived. All my neighbors' houses were dark, meaning that no one was there to see me skulking past them. Not that anyone on my street would have cared about a random teenage boy. But you can never be too careful. Sarah and I were supposed to meet at the Circle K near Main Street, grab some snacks to stuff into her bag for the movie, and hightail it to the theater without being seen by a curfew officer. Seemed simple enough, so we got right to it. We joked and laughed as we made our way to the convenience store, saying how the walk back home would be extra creepy. Sometimes we intentionally like to creep ourselves out after seeing a horror movie. It really heightened the experience, you know? After stuffing my pockets and her backpack with Sour Patch Kids, Junior Mints, Gummy Worms, and Soda Cans, Sarah and I made our way to the theater. We were expecting at least one cop car to pass us by. The area we were going to was pretty heavily patrolled, but there was no sign of them. In fact, we didn't pass a single car or person once we crossed the dimly lit parking lot and came face to face with Main Street. 
Sarah and I looked at each other. Sure, a small town has its ghost town days, but there weren't even any people lining up for a movie, and a pretty popular one at that. There didn't even seem to be people coming or going home from work either. I got a little prickle in my stomach right then. Something that said, you should probably go home. Something is wrong here. One look at Sarah told me she was suddenly feeling nervous about the whole thing too. But I brushed the twist in my gut aside in favor of trying to play it cool and look brave. Just because the theater was dead didn't mean anything was wrong, right? It was just an unusually quiet night. The ticket person let us in without any issue, though he did make a note about how two kids like us shouldn't be out on a night like tonight. Sarah asked him why, and the guy shrugged and said that he didn't know exactly what was happening, but he saw a ton of police cars going down the street earlier, all with lights flashing and sirens blaring. It seemed like something pretty serious was going down. Thankfully, that was in the opposite direction of where we'd be heading at the end of the movie. We told him we'd be fine. The movie itself was fantastic. I felt a genuine shiver run through me as the film reached its conclusion. Sarah squeezed my hand the entire time and gave me a look as the credits rolled. To be honest though, with what the guy said about all the police cars, that made me reconsider finding a spot to make out on the way home. She agreed, and once we tossed and ate our remaining popcorn, we made our way down Main Street. We scanned for any sign of returning cops, but there was still nobody around. We figured they were probably still dealing with the emergency on the other side of town. Sarah and I were able to relax a little. Not enough to linger anywhere, but enough to slow down and talk about the movie a bit. Sarah was just saying something when she suddenly paused. I asked her what was up and she shushed me and pointed to a tractor supply store a little ways down the street. Hey, look behind the tractors, right there! At first, I had no idea what she was seeing. Then, as my eyes squinted and focused, I could see a police car parked sideways behind the row of red, blue, and green tractors. The marker was clearly visible, but its lights were all dark. Its windows were also tinted, so I couldn't tell if someone was in it or not. It sat motionless in the parking lot, hiding, as if waiting for someone to pass by and cause trouble. Sarah said we should cross the street and hide before the officer inside noticed us. That sounded like a good plan to me. Before we could, though, the police car flared to life. It raced out of the tractor supply with enough speed to skid across the pavement. They even did a U-turn and turned to face us. The headlights were turned off and we could just see the outline of a guy sitting in the driver's seat. This was not normal. We were freaked out by the whole situation. The police car slowly made its way towards us. We expected it to pull over and stop, or for the officer to roll down his window and ask what we were doing out so late. But instead, the car picked up speed and sped off into the night. Lights still dark. We breathed a sigh of relief. We weren't sure what we'd seen exactly. But given the night we'd had, we wanted to head back home straight away. The next day, Sarah texted me a link to a news article that it released that morning before we woke up. It turns out that when the police cars had their drive by the movie theater, they'd been responding to an armed robbery in progress at the local jewelry store. During a standoff, the robber had somehow overtaken an officer and stolen his police car, leading to a manhunt that spanned the entire town. They still hadn't caught the guy yet. They didn't even know who it was at the time, so good luck with that. Sarah was absolutely certain the car we saw at the tractor supply was the stolen one, and that the guy behind the wheel had just committed the armed robbery. It makes sense, but it also creeps me the hell out. Anything could have happened when he cornered us on that deserted street. I'm just glad nothing did. I'd never been out on a canoe before, mostly because of some turbulent family history with being on the water. So, when a friend of mine offered to take me out one day, I was curious enough to say yes. That friend went by the name Adam, 
He was a little older than the rest of us, articulate with poetry and quite handsome, so a few of the girls in our group had a crush on him, me included. The five of us planned to go on a camping trip by a large lake in our area that spring. We were all really excited. It's an odd time to go camping for some, but it was spring vacation and we wanted to make the most of it before going back to school. The guy who owned the spot said it was a completely new one. No one had ever camped there before. We had to clear the spot of debris as well as make our own fire pit. We were all outdoorsy people though, so that wasn't really an issue for us. Actually, it was pretty fun clearing the leaves and seeing what we could find. I even found a snake under a pile of leaves. The tiny guy was scared and trying to bite us, so Adam picked him up and put him down a bit further away from our sight so we wouldn't accidentally get hurt. Being a big fan of reptiles myself, I found myself being even more drawn to Adam because of that. I wanted to get to know him a little more on this trip. After we all settled around the fire and had our fill of hot dogs and cheeseburgers and whatever, Adam came up to me and asked if I'd ever been canoeing before. I said no. He said he'd brought one out to use on the lake while we were here and asked if I wanted my first lesson. Of course, I told him yes. I was going to do it, spend some alone time with Adam, and maybe, if I was lucky, see if he felt anything for me. I knew it was a long shot, but you can't blame me for trying, right? We decided to set out on the water in the later afternoon. Sunset, us all alone in the middle of the lake on the golden water, it would be perfect for a date. He loaded the boat and had me get in at the front. He pushed off with ease and powered us out, while I fumbled with the oars myself. We laughed about my splashing and started talking about anything and everything. My heart was beating a mile a minute the entire time, and not just from all the exercise. Adam looked really cute. He was smiling at me more than I'd ever seen him before. I thought that there was no way something could come along and distract us now. Not the fire going out, not a tent coming loose, especially not one of our other friends. But I was wrong. Suddenly, Adam seemed to be looking somewhere behind me. I thought he was going to point out a cool-looking bird or some other animal, but the expression on his face told me it was not anything good. He looked pale, and there was a hint of fear in his eyes. I started to ask him what was going on, but he put a finger to his lips and made a gesture to be quiet. Try to stay low, he said. There's someone watching us. He pulled me down below the lip of the canoe, as low as we could possibly crouch down. My back was crushed against his chest. Normally, this would have sent my heart pounding, but under the circumstances, all I could feel was an ice-cold shiver creeping up my neck. Together, we peeked back up over the top of the canoe, and I heard Adam swear. Oh, fuck. There was another boat out on the water a little ways away from us. In the dark, I thought it was a guy setting up his fishing rod, but when I focused a bit more and my eyes adjusted, I realized with shock that it was a rifle that he was pointing right at us. I almost yelled out loud, but Adam quickly put a hand over my mouth. Don't move! He kept repeating under his breath. I don't know if it was more for me or for himself. Maybe both. The man stayed motionless for what seemed like minutes, just looking at us down his rifle. He didn't say a word, not one damn thing as he toyed with us like it was a sick game. I couldn't make out any of the guy's features, but I could tell he was tall. I could also make out the hints of a wild expression on his face. The only time he moved was to slowly pan the barrel of his gun back and forth between me and Adam, as if he was trying to decide who to get rid of first. We needed to find a way out of here, now. I grabbed an oar and frantically started splashing, trying to turn this thing around and keep us moving. If we were moving, the guy wouldn't have a clear target. Stupid, I know, but it was a hell of a lot better than just being sitting ducks out on the lake. Adam followed suit, and we had just managed to turn around when the first shot fired. The man missed. The bullet made a splash as it hit the water only a bit away from our boat. The shot made my ears ring. I heard Adam shouting, What the hell are you doing? We paddled. More shots rang out, 
but they seemed to be splashing on either side of us instead of finding a direct target in us. They then seemed to stop, though we didn't look back until we almost ran aground, out of range of the rifle seemingly. Adam didn't even bother dragging the boat on land. He jumped out and told me to follow, and I wasn't going to question him. We dove behind the trees trying to catch our breath. We could hear our friends laughing and setting up another fire in the distance. I wanted to scream at them to duck and be quiet, that there was a guy with a gun out on the water that might be heading towards us, but no words would come out. My mouth moved, but my breath just wheezed out of my chest. Was I a coward? There was fight, flight, and freeze, and out of the options my body had chosen for me, Adam was the one to warn everyone. He squeezed my hand and forced me out of the freeze, dragging me along with him back to camp. Our friends, of course, didn't believe us when we told them what happened. At least, not at first. They thought we were playing some kind of joke on them. But honestly, what kind of friend would play a sick prank like that? We told them, look out on the lake and you'll see him. Sure enough, the small boat was still bobbing out on the water. The man was facing away from all of us, but you could see the shine of his rifle when he lit up a flashlight. Our friends didn't say anything after that. We snuffed out the fire and piled into a tent together, sat around and tried to overcome the shock and figure out what to do. We could call the police or the owner, but it wasn't guaranteed the person wouldn't find us before they got here. He could also just disappear with no evidence, too. We'd be screwed if everyone thought it was a prank call. We could try and get back to the car ourselves, but there was no easy way to hightail it out of there a second time without risking getting hit. To put it another way, we were screwed no matter how we sliced it. The five of us sat in the dark, listening to the crickets and trying not to hyperventilate. Adam held my hand the entire time. He later apologized for even taking me out that day, but I knew the situation wasn't anyone's fault. Not anyone except that random gunman. Eventually, we took a chance and called 911. The police arrived with the owner in tow 15 minutes later, sirens blaring and lights on full display. They thankfully took the call quite seriously, and we all breathed a sigh of relief when an officer identified themselves outside our tent. They searched the area, but didn't find any traces of the man, not even any spent casings. He probably had the foresight to take them with him when he was done with his fun. The owner said he'd never permitted anyone but us to be on his property, and apologized profusely. He wanted to press charges for trespassing, but that would be difficult, since we didn't even have a clear description of this person. We left the campsite before we even got a full day into our trip. We never went back either. One silver lining that came from the experience was that Adam and I did spend a lot more time together, and even dated for a little while afterward. Though we didn't work out in the end because of unrelated reasons, we're still great friends to this day, and I'll always be grateful to him, both for breaking my apprehension about a pastime I now love, and for saving my life that day. We still don't know why that man decided to target us that day, but I guess I'd rather not know after all these years. I just hope he doesn't do it to anyone else. This is something that happened back when I was a kid. I think I was seven years old back then. My parents had a membership to Costco. Both my mom and dad would go there all the time. In fact, it was probably the main store we would get most of our groceries and stuff. One time, I went there with just my dad. I don't remember exactly why my mom or any of my siblings didn't go with us, but I do remember it was just us two. After we got inside, we got drinks from the cafeteria that Costco has, where you could buy food and things like that. We shopped for all the things we had to get that day. I'm not sure exactly how long, but it probably took about 30 minutes or so. I remember going up and down just about every aisle. It seemed my dad would take even longer than my mom to shop, because he wasn't as organized. He had a list, but he never seemed to know where anything was, and would go up and down the same aisles over and over. After we were finally done shopping, we checked out. 
My dad said he had to use the bathroom real quick before we left and asked me if I had to go too. I did, but I didn't want to use the restroom at Costco. I felt I could wait until we got home, so I said no. I waited right by the shopping cart outside the bathroom. My dad went in, and less than 30 seconds after, I saw this weird guy coming up towards me. I remember that I thought he must have worked there for some reason. The guy was sort of big and had glasses on. He asked me if I was waiting for my dad, and I said yes. He then told me that I was not allowed to wait there, and that it was a new rule. This sounds so stupid years later, but at the time I actually believed him. He said that he would show me where I could wait instead. I grabbed the card and started to follow him. He told me I could just leave the cart there though. The guy went right around the corner, only about 10 feet away, and opened these doors that led to some kind of hallway. I didn't even know that was there. We both went inside, and the guy kept walking down to this door, which seemed to lead to the parking lot outside. By now, I was obviously very confused. It looked like we were going to leave. I stopped right where I was, knowing that something was seriously wrong with this situation. The guy stopped as well and turned back to me. He told me to keep following him, but I was not that stupid. I started to turn around and go back. The guy ran up to me and grabbed my arm. Right then, the doors that we had come through opened back up, and I saw my dad there. The guy who had me turned around, letting me go. He then ran to the door to the parking lot and left immediately. My dad ran in and grabbed me and asked me what was going on. I told him everything that happened. The police ended up being called to the Costco. I didn't realize just how serious of a situation that was at the time, but I do now years later. I still feel lucky that I got away from that guy. I mean, my dad wasn't even in the bathroom for a single minute, and I was right outside of it. After that day, I don't think I ever went back to Costco. I had a Costco membership last year just for a couple of months. It seemed like a good deal, and at first I liked it a lot. I would shop there at least one time per week, but usually more. One day I went there to get some groceries and everyday items. I had a lot of shopping to do that day, and Costco was not the only store I had to go to. There was one other store I would be going to afterwards. I spent a while while shopping inside Costco, and when I was done, I was starting to get really hungry. I stopped by the cafe they had at the front of the store. There was an area to buy food and drinks, as well as some tables set up around it. I grabbed some pizza and churros, and went out to one of the tables to eat. I didn't want to eat in my car. I was at a table on the side, kind of tucked away into the corner of the cafeteria area. I was minding my own business, just eating my meal, when I looked up to see this guy staring right at me. He was sitting in front of me, and there were two open tables in between us. The guy was staring at me so intensely that it instantly creeped me out. He had these wild bug eyes. I had to look down right away. When I looked up again, he was still staring. Was this guy joking around? It really didn't seem like it to me. I didn't know this guy either, I didn't recognize him, and couldn't think of why he'd be staring at me like this. I didn't bother to try to talk to him or anything, it was way too weird. I decided to just go out to my car and leave. I got up from the table and walked away. When I did, luckily the man remained seated at his table, watching me all the while. I went out to the parking lot and found my car. I went inside and quickly finished eating my items. I then headed to my final stop of the day, one last store. This store was just five minutes away, and it was pretty busy when I got there, just like Costco had been. I drove around to find an open parking space towards the back and parked my car. I then went inside and did my shopping. Didn't really take as long in there, maybe only about 15 minutes or so. I came back out and started heading to my car. 
Right as I got inside, I happened to glance across the parking lot and saw the exact same guy from before. He was sitting inside of a car in the driver's seat, staring at me in the same way he had been earlier. This creeped me out even more so than before. I immediately backed out and started driving away to leave. The problem was, I had to drive right by his car to get to the exit of the parking lot. As I drove past him, his car pulled out and began driving behind me right away. My heart sank when I saw this. Now I was leaving the parking lot with this creep following me. I turned right, and he did the same. I drove down the road a little ways, and turned again. He remained right on my tail. I didn't even care about going home anymore at this point. I just started randomly driving and turning at almost every opportunity. Soon, even I didn't really know where I was anymore. I was just turning down all these random, quiet roads. I found myself inside a residential area with the guy still following me. It became quite clear to me that this guy would follow me wherever I went. I wasn't exactly sure what to do, but that's when I finally got the idea to just drive down to the police station. I put the closest one in on my phone and then followed the directions to get there. It took maybe 10 minutes, with the guy following me still the entire time. When I got there, I pulled into the parking lot. The guy didn't. He just kept driving down the road. It worked just as I hoped it would. I waited there for a little while before actually going home. I was afraid the guy would still be waiting around to find me around some corner or something and then keep following me. Luckily, it seems he got impatient and gave up. I was able to make it home safely and did not see the man again. I used to work at Costco. My job was mainly as a cashier up at the checkout lanes. I'd had this job for six months or so, and it was pretty okay. Something really scary happened once though, so I thought I would share my experience. It all started on a Friday night. I was working a shift where I got off at 8pm. I'm not sure when I started, but I do remember it was not that long of a shift. Things went by pretty easily, and by the time the shift was over, it was really dark outside. When I got off after clocking out, I left the store to return to my car. I had parked at the very back end of the parking lot, kind of in the middle area. Behind our parking lot, there were some more businesses and other stores and restaurants, but they were separated by this row of trees. I was excited to go home after a long day of work. When I got within 20 feet of my car and took out my keys, I was about to push the unlock button on my key fob when I saw something. Somebody was inside my car. I stopped in my tracks and looked a bit closer. It appeared as though there was a man sitting in the back seat of my vehicle. He was looking in the other direction and not towards me. I checked to make sure this was in fact my car. I knew that it was, but why would somebody be inside of it? I didn't go any further. I turned around and walked back to the Costco entrance. My mind was racing. I was trying to figure out how and why somebody was inside my vehicle. I was also wondering what the hell I should do about it now. I found a co-worker inside of the store who I was friendly with and told her about what had happened. She offered to come outside with me and look to see if the person was still there. We both walked out and slowly approached my car. We stopped at about 50 feet away and looked inside. It looked like the man was gone now. We walked closer to the car and very carefully made it within 10 feet or so. That's when we could see the guy was still in there but was now ducking down in the back seat. Luckily, he didn't seem to have noticed us. We walked back a ways, and my co-worker told me to hit the unlock button to my car to see if the man would leave. I did so, and we waited, kind of hiding behind another vehicle in the lot. The guy did not leave mine, though. We could no longer see him because he was ducked down still, but we would be able to tell if he left. He continued to stay inside. 
After waiting for a few minutes, we both decided to head back into the Costco. We were thinking about calling the police after talking for several minutes inside. After talking to another co-worker about it, I decided I would walk back outside to call the police and stand near the entrance doors of the Costco, just in case the man tried to make an escape. I began dialing the number. It was at this point I saw the man actually get out of my vehicle. He left out the rear passenger side door, which was the furthest away from me. I then saw him slip away behind the trees, leading to some of the other businesses nearby. I carefully walked back to my car. I kept my eyes on that tree line the entire time. The guy was now out of my sight, and who knows where he was hiding. If he came back, I wanted to be able to see him. I was able to get inside my car and lock the doors, then finally drove back to my house. When I got home, I looked throughout my entire car. Everything seemed to be the same. I never really kept anything of value inside of it. In fact, I didn't really have anything in it at all. Nothing had been stolen, and nothing was damaged either. I don't know what that guy was doing in there, but it really gives me the creeps. Did he know it was specifically my car? Or was this just a random thing, and I was unfortunate enough to be the victim? I don't know. I figure I must have forgotten to lock my car doors, though usually I always remember to lock them. I guess it must have slipped my mind this time. I don't know how else to explain him being able to get inside my car. I'm just glad he left on his own. He must have realized I'd known he was there when I unlocked the vehicle but never got inside. I'm a former Costco member. If you don't know what Costco is, you pay a monthly fee in order to shop at the store. The prices are a little bit cheaper, and you can buy many things in bulk, which is why there's a membership. The store is massive, and they also have a gas station at most locations. This is generally situated at the back of the parking lot, and you can get cheaper gas if you're a member. When I was a member there, the store would always be super busy when I shopped. And people would seemingly be everywhere. The area was pretty populated, so it did make sense, but it still surprised me every time. Even more busy than the store, though, was the gas station. I know everybody goes crazy over gas prices, so I think all the members like to get gas at Costco. I would always get my gas there when I was a member, too because I would save a lot of money. Plus, I only lived about 10 minutes away from the store. One time, I had to go grocery shopping and get gas as well. I was almost out. When I pulled into the parking lot, I saw a long line of cars for the gas station. This was not at all uncommon, but I had never seen it quite as long as it was on this particular day. There were four gas pumps, so eight areas total for cars that could be fueling at once. Costco had a few employees out there to work near the gas station and had two people there to literally help control the line. It would have been chaos without them, but even with them, it was pretty bad. There were two main lines of cars and probably five to ten of them in each line. That's how backed up the thing was. I considered waiting until later in the day to get some gas, but ultimately decided to just get in the back of the line. I went into the left line and committed to it. Things actually started to move faster than I expected. I moved up a couple of spaces, but was still last in line. Soon, some other people joined in behind me, and in the next line over as well. Luckily for me, the line I was in was moving faster for some reason. I guess I was just pretty lucky that day. When there was just one car in front of me waiting to get gas, somebody left. The car in front of me moved up. I was about to drive forward as well. Then I would be on the deck. But as I started driving, one of the cars from the other line on the right tried to pull in front of me. I couldn't believe it. This guy was supposed to stay in his line. Nobody was just switching lines. I didn't let him in, of course and quickly pulled forward. He had to stop on a dime. He was diagonal between the line that he had been in and my line. He started to honk at me, 
but I didn't care. After that, though, I saw his door open up. He actually got out and started yelling at me. He was a bigger guy, but not that tall. He had a dark mustache and his head was shaved. I rolled down my window a little and yelled back to stay in his own line. The guy started cursing and yelling at me, saying how I wasn't moving up fast enough and he was in a hurry. He started saying that some of us have places to be. The guy was causing a whole scene. Somebody else rolled down their window as well and told him to get back in his car. Within minutes, one of the employees that was working over there came over and tried to calm the guy down. He finally got back inside of his vehicle. Then it was my turn to get gas. I did so quickly and left the gas station. I headed to the Costco parking lot and parked my car. I then went inside. While I was inside, I got my cart and started shopping for the things I was getting. Not a whole lot, just a few food items. I pushed my cart down one aisle and grabbed some things. As I was pushing further toward the back of the store, I heard another person start walking behind me. I didn't really think anything of it. The person was walking really fast though and passed me on the right side. When they passed by me, I saw it was the same guy who'd yelled at me before. After passing me by, he went right in front of my cart and stopped abruptly. I had to stop quickly and my cart hit this guy in his back a little. He then turned around and asked me what my problem was. I'd had enough of this guy. I told him to leave me alone, and I was tired of all his nonsense. I probably didn't quite say it that politely, though. The guy cursed at me one more time, then walked away. I watched him go back towards the front of the store. I was really glad to see him gone. Our interaction inside the store lasted for no more than a minute. I was able to continue my shopping without any more problems. I looked around almost constantly to make sure that I wouldn't go near that guy, just in case he was still somewhere inside. I just wanted to avoid him. He seemed to be nothing but trouble. Luckily, I didn't see him for the rest of the time I was shopping in there. I checked out and then left the store. I walked back to my car in the parking lot, only to see it was now all scratched up. The guy had keyed my car. My car is black, and both sides had about four or five long scratch marks on them. I was so angry, and I knew exactly who had done it. I called the police right there and waited for them to arrive. Then I told them the whole story. I didn't know the man's name or license plate, but I did know his car model. Plus, I figured he must be a Costco member. They ended up locating him quite easily, and he was forced to pay for my car to be repaired. He was also banned from Costco. After that experience, I hope I never see him again. I no longer have a Costco membership. That's not the reason why I stopped, though. I just prefer to go to other stores now. I will never forget that experience. I grew up in the 1990s, born in the late 80s. I remember getting my first bike and starting to explore the area I grew up in, upstate New York. Where I grew up is much different now than it was in the 90s. It was much more rural, with clusters of neighborhoods here and there. I lived near an old landfill, and the main road connected a lot of semis down to some factories in a neighboring town. That was a five-minute bike ride. We also had an old Baptist church that was founded by an eccentric former hippie who was really good to the community. My dad was a very serious drinker and loved to fish and hunt, etc. He loved to go with his friend because it gave him an excuse to drink and kill something. He ended up making this deal with this pastor and the gentleman who owned a pond behind the church to stock it up with fish. At the time, my dad and his friends started becoming serious competitive fishers. They would go out on a boat, which my dad eventually had to sell his share to to keep drinking. My friends and I had permission to fish there in the summer as well, and we would swim in there too and all that. I lived easily less than five minutes from this pond. My friends and I went out there one summer day. It was around 1995, I believe. 
my mom had heard on the news a week prior about this wave of kid landings. I don't remember if Amber Alerts were a thing back then yet, so she decided to make a code word with me. She came to me and told me that if anyone ever tried to convince me they knew my mom or dad, in the hopes to get me into their car, to ask them for the code word. Ours was Pickles. Fast forward to our fishing trips. My friends left before me. After that, we sat around and swam more than anything. My friend Dennis got mad because he was serious about fishing, so he and his brother left. I was now all alone. On the road, once you got past this area, it was a straight shot to the main part of town. I got down to my area and was about to turn in. I didn't realize I was being followed by a pickup with this Cletus-looking guy from The Simpsons in it. He greeted me and told me that my mom and dad were waiting for me at this local restaurant which I knew. He told me they'd asked him to come and get me and meet them there so we could all have dinner. I immediately thought about what my mom had said and started getting this evil feeling like I was in danger. I told him that my parents specifically had a password that they gave to their friends and that if he was really their friend, he was required to tell me. At that point, he got mad and started swearing at me. I didn't see one, but I was certain he had a gun on him as he started fumbling around in his truck. I turned around and started pedaling back down my road, screaming for help and that I was in danger. He jerked his truck to follow, but I was making too much noise and was already right next to my house. He decided it was a lost cause and took off. When I got there, my mom was home and I was hysterical. I asked her why she would ask such a mean friend to come pick me up. I told her what happened and she didn't believe me. She calmed me down and told me I did the right thing, but I could tell she had a hard time believing what I was saying. She'd also grown up in the same town and nothing like that had ever happened to her. A few days later, a friend of hers told her a similar story about her son in another part of town. The police then became involved. The cops came and talked to me, and I gave them the same description of the man, truck, and everything that happened. I don't know if the guy was ever caught. I used to be very bitter at my mom for not believing me, but now I understand the confusion she had. Instead of reacting right away, she tried to console me and keep an eye on everything. My dad, on the other hand, was more vigilant about it and would ask me all the time when he'd take me out if someone looked like that guy or if a truck looked like the same one I'd seen. I hope no other kids were harmed by him. The personal part of this story was told to me by my friend's older brother, Jay, and his mom. The rest is common knowledge. Around my hometown, when Jay was about 10 years old in 1992, an ice cream truck started driving around town. It was in the middle of summer, and the truck stopped at all the lakes and parks in their town. Nobody really thought much of it, because their town was small and rural, of course they'd have a local ice cream truck. Being 10, Jay was excited whenever he heard the ice cream truck drive around. That is, he was excited until he actually convinced his mom to give him some money and let him buy an ice cream from the truck. He sprinted to the truck with excitement, which had stopped about a block from his house. He got a very funny feeling from the guy driving it. He was one-fourth Native American, and his mom was a full half and was an actual medicine woman. The whole family believed heavily in trusting their intuitions. When Jay got that weird feeling about the driver, he simply backed away and went home, even though there was a group of three or four boys at the truck already. He told his mom about his inexplicable feeling of unease when he saw the man at the driver's seat, and his mom told him to stay away if it didn't feel right. A couple of weeks later, two boys went missing while they were out at a park. Their moms had turned their backs for less than a minute. At first, it was assumed that they went exploring in the nearby creeks, looking for salamanders. 
but after hours of searching, it came out the last vehicle seen in the area was that very same ice cream truck. The truck then stopped showing up for multiple days after. Cue the police asking the town officials about the ice cream man. It turned out that nobody knew the guy. He didn't fill out the proper paperwork or get a license, nor did he do whatever it is you have to do to drive an ice cream truck. Nobody thought anything of it, because the guy had so confidently showed up and seamlessly started driving his route. I guess he had scouted out the locale beforehand in another car, or perhaps on foot, and picked out all the areas kids like to hang out at. The driver couldn't contain himself for long, though. He started driving his truck around the shadiest parts of the town, trailer parks and the like. A week after, the boys went missing. This trailer park was literally on the wrong side of the tracks, with a railroad running right down the side. The town dump was just a little farther down the street. It was at the very edge of town, with nothing else around it but empty woods. I forgot to mention that the town is in rural Michigan, so the trailer park was about a mile deep into the woods. The cops were called and told that the guy seemed to be living in that trailer park. They found his truck with tarp haphazardly thrown over it and burst into the nearby trailer and arrested him. This is where local legend starts taking over. I don't really know what they found inside the trailer. I've heard the trailer was filled with memorabilia from past children. I've also heard it was just a shitty trailer that looked like a hobo with a roofing plastic fetish lived there. I do know that the guy ended up confessing after the police found some evidence in his trailer, telling them that he had kidnapped, murdered, and reared the two boys, finally dumping their bodies at the dump just down the street. It was the grisliest thing to happen in that town's history. And a few years later, when I was growing up, things were much more strict. There were cameras at all the parks now, and an organized neighborhood watch program. A see something, say something law was also enacted. Once smartphones became popular, I downloaded the sex offender database app and set it to my hometown. It seems my hometown is sex offender central. There are dozens of them living in the downtown area maybe 10 blocks by 10 blocks, and over three dozen within the boundaries of my school district. One lived less than a mile away from me, on some dark wooded road. So this happened when I was 11 years old. My parents and I had just moved from one state to another in the USA. We had just finished unpacking all our stuff, and I was about to start my first day at a new school in the third state in four years. I was already nervous and didn't want to go to school, but my parents insisted I go so I could make friends since we had just moved there. My dad was working, but not my mom at the time. She stood with me outside the house, waiting for the bus to come early in the morning. On this morning, there happened to be a really tattered-looking minivan parked right across the street from our house. Its windows were covered in duct tape and cardboard, and it was streaked with mud and dirt. The driver of the van was staring us down through the window. My mom was about to open the door to let the dog out, but at that moment, the man in the minivan opened his door too, looking like he was getting ready to sprint from it. When she closed the door, he did the same. Once more, she tried to open the door, and he copied her again. She closed it in a hurry. The man looked very frustrated as he closed his door once more. My mom went and grabbed the phone and started dialing the police. Once the guy saw her with phone in hand, he sped off right away. She gave a description of the guy and his van, including the license plate number. Later, we found out the man was arrested for carrying an unregistered pistol. He had a couple rolls of duct tape, a baseball bat, and several knives as well. There was also a package of huge black garbage bags inside his van. I'm not sure exactly how things would have ended if my mom had fully opened the door, but I think I have a pretty good idea.
In the words of a sage YouTuber called Markiplier, fuck the ocean. He was absolutely right. I'll never go to the ocean again. The beach? Okay, sure. But going in the water? No way. I never thought I'd get out of it to tell this story. So I want to tell you why now that I have. I live just off the coast of Maine, USA, in a part of the coastline that's more rock and fishing wharves than beaches and hotels. The ocean there is gray and rough, waves smashing away at the shore and pieces breaking off at times with a violent sound like thunder. Boats get rocked back and forth in the local harbor like ducks in the water daily, and things never seem to calm down, even on sunnier days. As such, I stayed far away from the water when it was stormy. You could feel little sprays of it on the wind, and the salt seemed to clog your nostrils until you got inside. When my daughter begged me to go watch one particular storm with her, though, I found it quite difficult to say no. She was eight at the time and very interested in the weather. She'd even gotten one of those weather kits for her birthday a few months back. And as her father, I really wanted to encourage that curiosity. Some of you might call me an idiot, but we were going to stay on high ground and in the car at all times, just in case. The storm was said to be one for the record books, 50 mile an hour winds and waves just as tall, supposedly. The Weather Channel said there was expected to be some flooding and cautioned all boat owners to storm-proof their vessels and under no circumstances to go out on the water that day. Sounded reasonable to me. We headed out around mid-afternoon. Already, storefronts were shuttered and reinforced in town, and the boats were grounded, clumped together in the harbor. Homes around us had also been reinforced, and some people were even packing their cars to head to a safe spot to weather out the storm for a day or two, just in case. We probably should have taken that initiative too, in retrospect, but I had no way of knowing what our little storm-chasing trip would result in. Above the harbor on a cliffside road, there was a little viewing area where one or two cars could park and basically overlook the sea on any given day. I thought this was a perfect and safe way of viewing the storm. When we parked, I also let my daughter go up to the railing and seat herself between the rungs. I stood beside her, holding onto her hand and wanting to savor the moment. Dark clouds rolled over the churning water, and my daughter was enthralled when chains of lightning started to flash over the horizon. She kept telling me to look and had the biggest grin an eight-year-old could ever possibly have. My heart warmed up seeing her happy, even though I was shivering in the strong winds and hunkering down in my jacket. I wished I had brought a thermos of hot coffee or soup to tide me over, but there was nothing I could do about it now. My daughter passed the time by telling me about the different clouds and weather reactions she could see out there, and I wondered with her about what the fish under the waves felt, if anything, as the water tossed around like dirty bedsheets. I guess they were probably used to it, but my daughter wasn't so sure. She said she hoped all the fishes were okay out there. I laughed and looked out at the waves. That's when we both saw something that made our stomachs churn, or at least mine did. There was a small motor boat just bobbing up and down on the waves, away from the harbor. It really should have been anchored. It seemed to barely keep up with the massive waves. At one point, a wall of water nearly crested over top of them. What the hell were these people doing? Did they get lost? Did they lose track of time? Were they not local and hadn't heard the storm warning for the day on the news? Maybe. But even with all those excuses, there was no escaping the dire situation occurring in front of us. A group of people were going to drown right in front of me and my daughter, and we couldn't do anything about it. Now, this was at the time before cell phones, but I don't think making a call would have made much a difference in these conditions anyway. My daughter looked worried and asked if they were going to make it. I felt my heart crack in two when the boat made its first nosedive under the water. My daughter cuddled close and clutched my arm, as if trying to keep from getting tossed in her own storm. 
No matter how fast she was growing up, she was still a kid, and you're not supposed to see something like this when you're a child. I shielded her eyes. She tried to peek out from between my fingers a few times, but I told her not to. Don't look. It'll be okay. They'll make it. They were all lies I regret telling, but I didn't know what else to do at that moment. The boat had no control anymore. It veered sideways underneath a crushing wave, just as it crashed against a rock that jutted out. That did it. Even from that far away, it looked as if the boat popped in half without any carnage, but I could picture the splintering, the people inside with their bones being crushed against the rock, all the blood that would probably float on top of the water. I shuddered just holding my daughter. I tried to convince her and myself that everything was fine. It was just an empty boat, swept out of the dock to the sea by the tide. But I knew better. The boat was driving evasively through the waves, and that meant there was at least one person inside controlling it, and that person had just died. Needless to say, my daughter and myself needed a lot of counseling to move past that event. She's doing much better now, but I don't know if I could say the same for myself. Twenty-one and female. I don't know exactly how long this will be. It took me about four days to be able to actually type this out. I got weird mini anxiety attacks when I tried. I'll be the first to admit I have had a very can't happen to me sort of complex, and that's kind of what occurred in this story. I'm a university student and live in a rental house with five other people. It's far from ideal, but in this housing outcry that we're living in, it takes that sting off of having to pay a bunch of money a month just to exist in a little box. This does have relevancy, I swear. I got extremely lucky last weekend when the five other roommates I had were all out for the weekend. This had never happened before, so I was ecstatic to have the house all to myself. I did the whole 21-year-old girl home alone stuff you can think of, watching movies with the volume up loud, taking long-ass showers, walking around the house without a bra, etc, etc. It was around 10 p.m. I had finished some homework and was relaxing with a glass of wine and watching some streaming services. It sounded briefly like there was something moving on the porch outside. We've had a fox in our yard before, and the thing used to make a lot of noise out there, so I assumed it must just be back now or something. After hearing some fumbling the second time, I went over to check through the window. I couldn't see anything out there. As I'm turning to head back into the living room, a piece of cement suddenly flew through our kitchen window. I think I peed myself a little bit when that happened. I definitely screamed like a little girl. My moronic ass started unlocking the door to go outside and check things out, but common sense seized control of me again, and I locked the door once more. I also ran to the back door to make sure it was still locked, even though it's glass and wouldn't make much of a difference. Oddly enough, at this time, my grandma's words came into my head about something her old mother had once told her. If someone tries breaking into your house, turn the lights off. You know the inside of your home better than they do. I shut off the lights in the living room and turned the TV off as well. My dad used to give me and my siblings advice on protection measures, but they were not resonating at this time. I secured myself in my upstairs bedroom and turned off all the lights in the house as I passed them by. While walking up the stairs, I could hear the doorknob shaking furiously at the front door. I don't know if it was more than one person or if they simply realized they couldn't jump the fence to get into the backyard. While talking with emergency services on speaker, I secured my hunting knife to the end of a hockey stick with hot pink duct tape, one of the most Canadian things I could say really. I stayed in the dark, holding my makeshift spear for about 15 minutes. I'm really glad I wasn't being murdered in that amount of time. The operator told me police were coming, and eventually they did, but it took a very unsettling amount of time. 
The only reason I left the bedroom in the first place was because I heard the knocking on the door downstairs and police lights flashing through the window. Otherwise, someone would have had to have come in and physically pull me out of the room. My statement was taken, but that's all they did. Literally all they did. Nothing else. A very nice female police officer stayed with me in the home and helped me clean up the glass until my brother showed up to bring me to his place for the rest of the weekend. I made an appointment with a doctor to get an anxiety medicine, as well as medicine for nightmares. I know I wasn't in any physical danger, at least at that point, but I've had some very charming dreams about similar scenarios, and I was just finding it easier to stay awake. Maybe that's juvenile of me, but I'm human. Meds are working fine now, and I'm back at my house wall to wall with people once again. But honestly, I don't hate that so much anymore. My Esso was in an accident, which demolished her car. After the accident, we stored the car in our driveway with a tarp covering it until the insurance towed it. She was in Canada for a convention, which left me and the dogs home alone for the weekend. When I got home from work, I thought it was a good idea to call my parents to catch up. I remember the wind was very intense that day and blew the tarp off the passenger side of the car. As I was speaking with my parents, I decided to pull the tarp back over the car to cover it up. As I'm talking with them and listening to them describe their day, I suddenly hear a faint voice call out, Hey! I had no idea where it was coming from, until I looked down. There was a man sitting in my car. I had never seen this man before. He looked at me for a moment, before asking, Where's Dan and Isaac? Now, I don't know either of those people, and I told him I did not. I could see he had all of the personal items from the car in his lap. I started telling him he needed to get out and leave. Then I saw pepper spray in his hands, which had been left behind by my SO. I knew in that moment that my day was about to end with being pepper sprayed, so I told my parents to call the cops. He stepped out of the car, asking where the ice was. I told him he had the wrong place and grabbed the CD case out of his hands. He reached for the pepper spray. I backed up. He eyed me for a moment, before saying, I'll be back, bro. Just you watch. I watched him walk off, and for a brief moment he started yelling at a tree down the street. The cops came and he was found up the road, but the officers could not find the rest of my stuff. That experience definitely freaked me out for the rest of the day. This took place in my hometown of Weymouth when I was 14 years old. My friends and I decided to go exploring in an abandoned building that was right next to some railroad tracks. We figured we could sneak into a loading bay that faced the tracks. Our plan was to sneak out at 11 p.m., get out of there by 11.30, and try to be back home by 1 o'clock. I will admit that I was scared in the days leading up to it. It was basically unheard of in my town for anyone to do anything remotely risky, but we were young and reckless, and we wanted some real excitement and adventure. The night came, and Tim and Charlie were supposed to meet me by a streetlight near a cafe. Then we would find the tracks and follow them for about a quarter mile until we arrived at the loading bay. I grabbed a couple of flashlights and headed out my door once my family finally fell asleep. As I was walking down to the cafe though, I heard footsteps approaching quickly from behind me. When I turned around, I was surprised to find no one was there. I ignored it, thinking that my mind was playing tricks on me. I was already anxious after all. After about five minutes though, it happened again. Again, I turned around in a snap, only to find that nobody was there. I finally got to the cafe, where we were supposed to meet up. My friends Tim and Charlie were already there, 
so we proceeded with our plan. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I wasn't about to let my friends know I was scared. We finally reached the abandoned building. One of the old rusty bay doors was jammed open just enough for us to slide underneath it. We entered the building and turned on our flashlights. There was graffiti everywhere. It was obvious we weren't the only ones that came in here looking for thrills. There was one piece of graffiti that really caught my eye. It was a metallic paint that stood out from the rest. It read, Don't Come Back. Hey, guys, come check this out. I called out to my friends. I was answered by manic footsteps pounding right behind me. I turned back to check what was going on, only to see a tall skinny man with greasy wiry hair. He wore horribly ripped clothes, and his eyes were open wide with a huge ear-to-ear -ear smile. I froze to the spot, utterly paralyzed by fear. The man threw his head back and let out a cackle the likes I'd never heard before. I just stood there in complete shock until my friends started screaming at me to run. And that brought me back to reality. I booked it. As I was approaching the bay door, I heard the man's footsteps right behind me. They were getting louder, and he was closing in quickly. I slid right through the door like a baseball player would. I scrambled to my feet and almost fell over. We made a break for it, but the thing that sticks with me even to this day, the thing that really chills me to the bone, was the voice that boomed out from the building after us. A slow, drawling call that only made us run even faster. What the hell was that? Tim panted as we ran. I don't know, I said. Charlie was so shaken up he couldn't even say a single word. When we got back to the cafe, we decided we would all go back to our houses, but there was one thought that kept me up for the rest of the night, one thought that still haunts me to this day. Those footsteps that I'd heard earlier that night, was that him? How long had he been following me? I guess I'll never know. I'm a woman and a freshman in college, attending a local university in my area. I decided to live on campus to get the full college experience. I didn't want to miss out on fun opportunities my college had to offer. Starting in a new school already made me nervous, but the idea of being all on my own in college made it all the more scary. I've never not had anyone before, being a twin and all. I've had a built-in best friend pretty much my whole life. My twin, however, went to a different college, and I was all alone. The semester started off like I'd anticipated. My classes were full of quiet and similarly anxious kids like myself, who also didn't really know what to expect. There was this one kid in my morning history class, though, who really put me off. He always wore this extremely dirty baseball cap, these cargo pants, and a tattered long t-shirt. He had a chubby face, but wasn't that overweight. At the same time, he wasn't really fit either. I don't know if you know what I mean. He had narrow glasses and talked endlessly about the most random things to anyone and everyone. He exhibited some very strange behaviors, but I didn't really think too much about him. He sat pretty far away from me, and I didn't think he would ever have the opportunity to bother me. That was until next class came. Our history class had finished up. I was packing my stuff up to leave, and I hadn't noticed this strange guy wandering over to my desk. That is, until I looked upward and saw him just silently hovering over me. I put on a weak smile. I waited for him to say something to me. Hi, I'm Connor, he said in a quietly monotone voice. It was so quiet I almost couldn't hear what he was saying. Hi, nice to meet you, Connor. I didn't say anything else. I thought it was a bit of a weird introduction, but again, it seemed harmless. That was until our next history class together. Everything went well during the class itself. I felt fine and Connor was minding his own business in his seat far away from me. 
as class was dismissed and everyone was packing up their belongings to leave once more, I was the last one out. I had to put many things, as well as my reading glasses, away and into my backpack. When I looked up at the door, Connor was there in the doorway waiting for me. He didn't exactly say anything, he just stood at the door watching me. I was very confused, as we'd never talked before really. He was just standing there, giving me this really unsettling look, watching me pack the rest of my things away. I slipped past him and walked out the door. He followed me, and he casually mentioned the tests we had taken that day, trying to brag to me, making it seem like he was above me in a way. I got a 91 on the test today. No big deal. What about you? 85, I responded. It was so easy, though. His response was very patronizing, and he seemed to be really mocking me. I didn't like it one bit. People who brag like that always tend to make me mad, and he seemed like one of those types of people. At some point down the stairs, it was a long way down because we were on the fourth floor, he started talking about sweatpants for some reason. He was mumbling so much that I couldn't even really hear what he was saying. To be honest, I just wanted to get away from him. I looked back only to find him slapping me in the face with a condom. I think you know what I'm talking about. Connor randomly said, while giving me a creepy smile. I awkwardly nodded my head, trying to stay collected as we reached the bottom of the stairs. Whatever he'd been mumbling couldn't have been anything good, or anything I wanted to talk about with him. I kept to myself, trying to get the hell away from this guy. I hadn't felt that uncomfortable in a while. Something about him was just very off-putting. I'm not a very confrontational person, and I hate to upset anyone in general. Connor asked me at one point to a homecoming dance that was being facilitated by a student organization on campus. When I told him that I would be visiting my parents on the day the dance was supposed to take place, his response really unnerved me. Well, I guess it's not like I can stop you from visiting your parents, but who knows what might happen. After that, I started exercising extreme caution around him. I didn't trust this guy, not one bit. That may seem obvious, but I'm telling you, you would not want to be alone in a dark alley with this guy. He was really giving off some Brock Turner type vibes. Some time passed by and I was in history class again. That day, we were taking another test. He finished his test early and walked out of the classroom. I was a bit relieved, actually. I finished my test around an hour later. I looked at my messages before exiting the classroom, only to see that one of my friends in that class had texted me. Hey, Connor's waiting for you outside. My heart started to beat really fast. There was no way he would be waiting for me. It had been an entire hour since he'd left. I peeked around the door to look into the waiting area outside the room. And sure enough, Connor was right there, just around the corner waiting. At this point, I really became scared and confused. Why would he be waiting for me for so long? We were not friends, and I never even hinted at the idea that I would ever be interested in him. I tried to quietly sneak out of class, but sure enough, he followed after me down the stairs, yet again talking about a whole bunch of weird, creepy stuff that I couldn't really make out well because of his mumbling. Something else I'd been noticing was that he seemed to be moving closer and closer to my desk each class, turning around and staring at me constantly. It made me feel so uncomfortable. I would give him the stare that pretty much said, what the hell are you looking at, showing him that I saw what he was doing, but he didn't seem to care. After this, he started to always follow me around. I pretty much ran away every time. There was another incident where I was walking into the history building and Connor was mid-conversation with some other girl from our class. He immediately stopped talking to her mid-sentence and followed me into the classroom. The creepiest part about all of this is that it's still going on to this day. I only have two months left with him in my class for this semester. 
I've tried to raise the issue with the school's administration, and they told me that unless he directly touches me and hurts me, there's nothing they would be able to do. I don't know how much longer I can take this. I have to look over my shoulder every time I go to school. If things get worse and he becomes more daring with his behavior, who knows what he would do next. Growing up, I lived in a heavily forested area. There's this now abandoned house that was in the woods behind my childhood home. The driveway connected to ours and broke off and circled around our garage, then went deeper into the trees. It was a single-story house with a big, nice front porch and had an outdoor overhang instead of a full garage. When I was a kid, we had an elderly neighbor who lived back there named Mr. Fisher. He was a Vietnam vet who was partially blind in one eye. He normally wear glasses and an eye patch. On the rare occasions that we saw him outside, he kept to himself mostly. He never really had any visitors either. It was about 20 years ago back, when I was in high school. I was home alone playing on my Nintendo. I remember it was later in the day, and it was raining pretty hard. I was grounded for some reason I can't quite remember, and was bitterly sitting in my room, taking out my teenage frustrations on the game. That's when I heard screaming coming from behind my house. I paused my game and cracked open my window. I listened in to make sure what I was hearing. Every few moments, I heard a faint screaming coming from Mr. Fisher's house maybe 50 or so yards away from my own. I couldn't figure out if it was an angry scream or a terrified one. I remember sitting there for a few moments, listening to it, more curious than alarmed really. After a few minutes, I got bored and shut the window. I returned to my video game. I don't know why I didn't call for help, or run over and knock on Mr. Fisher's door to see if things were okay. My only explanation is that I was a bitter teenager, and I didn't want to be bothered with anything that wasn't my business. Later that night after my parents came home, I was lying in bed when I once again heard the muffled screaming coming from behind the house. This time, though, I could tell it was clearly labored and ragged. I can remember being annoyed, wishing that whoever it was would just shut up already. I didn't even mention it to my parents the next morning. About a week goes by, and I had completely forgotten about the screaming I'd heard that night. I was outside throwing the football with my father when the mailman stopped his truck. He asked if any of us had seen Mr. Fisher. Apparently, he had not been collecting his mail in quite some time. My father replied that he hadn't seen his car for a few days either. I remained silent. The mailman and my father walked down the driveway and knocked on Mr. Fisher's door. The next thing I remember were all the sirens. An ambulance, a fire engine, multiple police cars arrived. I spent most of that afternoon up in a tree, watching Mr. Fisher's house as law enforcement and paramedics went in and out. My father had found his front door unlocked. He had been lying in a crumpled heap at the bottom of his basement stairs. It appears he had fallen and broken both of his legs, but it wasn't the fall that killed him. It was the rats. My father eventually told me that the coroner reported the man had been eaten alive while he was screaming for help, unable to climb back upstairs. He had defensive wounds all over his hands from swatting at them, and several dead rats were scattered around his corpse. In the end, there had been too many for him to fight off. His face had sustained the worst damage. There was almost nothing left of it when they found him. The coroner was convinced that he had been alive throughout the worst of it. I felt as though I had been stabbed in the stomach. A wave of traumatizing guilt washed over me, and I broke down in tears. I still didn't tell my parents, but on the inside I was mortified. I felt like a criminal. I felt like I killed him for ignoring those screams, and for weeks after that I was convinced the police were going to come back and arrest me for negligence. 
For years afterwards, it traumatized me, and I carried the guilt around in secret. I started doing drugs and drinking alcohol to dull the pain. In retrospect, I'm extremely lucky I graduated high school without overdosing or killing someone while being drunk behind the wheel. I was about 20 years old when myself and three of my friends went back to the house in late October. The house had been repossessed by the bank at this point and now sat condemned. Me and my friends sat down on the front porch and shared a bottle of bourbon. My family almost considered this vacant house our second home since it was so close to our property. My father would even do yard work every once in a while to make sure nothing was growing on the house. Like I said, my friends and I were drinking, smoking, and being belligerent idiots, just talking shit and lying about girls we slept with. I got up and went around the back of the house to take a piss. I happened to crouch down and glance inside one of those low-to-the-ground basement windows and scan the basement floor. There was no evidence left of those events back then. All I could really see was a cracked cement floor and loads of cobwebs crisscrossing the window. I took care of business. I was about to walk back around to the front when I paused and glanced back toward the window. I almost felt like I was being examined. For a moment, I thought I saw the outline of an old bearded face and a single eye staring up at me, kind of at an angle as if someone was trying to lift themselves up to peer out the window. I felt my body go numb and my mind go blank. I suppose even then the guilt still hadn't faded. I tried to convince myself it had either been a squatter or my imagination or something, but that night I had the most horrific nightmare. I was trapped in a dark room with rats crawling all over me and gnawing at my face as I laid there helpless. I woke up in the morning and felt sick. Honestly, for a while I wondered if maybe the man's spirit hadn't tried to confront me on why I hadn't helped him or something. I don't personally believe in the paranormal, but it was a very strong, eerie experience. I never wandered back to the old man's property again. When I was about 10, I remember being asleep in bed when I was suddenly awoken by some eerie sounds outside my first floor window. It was summertime, so my window was wide open and just the screen was in between me and the outside. Suddenly, I see a flashlight shine in through my room, starting on one side and moving over towards me. I remember quickly hopping out of bed in that moment and scrambling right underneath the window so whoever this was wouldn't see me. Thank God I managed it in time. It didn't seem they'd caught a glimpse of me. At that exact moment, my golden retriever ran into my bedroom and started growling and barking at whoever was outside. The light went out immediately and I heard multiple male voices talking nervously then sounds of them stumbling out of the bushes and running away. I couldn't sleep for about a week after. I was 19 at the time of this story. I was living in Littleton, Colorado at the time. For the brief amount of time that I lived there, I had many crazy situations happen to me. For now, though, I'll tell you about one in particular. It will help you to know what I looked like back then, so you can better understand why this may have happened to me. As I said, I was 19 at the time. I stood 5 foot 7, about 130 pounds, and I had wildly colored hair. Bright red, in fact. I had several facial piercings and an arm and chest tattoo as well. It was a warm day, so I was wearing very comfortable clothes. Shorts and a tank top, along with a pair of flip-flops and a sun hat. Because of previous encounters I'd had, I'd stopped taking walks at night. That day, I remember I'd let my boyfriend take my truck to work. Since I didn't have to work that day, and I had no plans to really go anywhere. 
I wanted to surprise him at work and take him to dinner after he got off though, so I started walking up Broadway towards Colfax. Now, if you've ever lived in the Denver area for any amount of time, people will generally warn you about Colfax Avenue. It's busy and some sketchy activity takes place on that street. But for some reason, my oh-so-awesome roommates never warned me of the many horrors that awaited me on Colfax Avenue. Okay, so maybe I'm being a bit dramatic, but my experience was not pleasant. Back to the story. I turned from Broadway onto Colfax. As soon as I turned down it, it was almost like stepping into another world. There was a bus stop where I'm pretty sure I saw some guy taking bumps right in the open, pressed up against the nearest building. Several homeless people were laying and sitting in various places up the street, and two women were ripping each other's hair out over something that I didn't care to gather. I walked very quickly for two or three blocks, with my heart in my throat. I was not cut out for this sort of social interaction. I accidentally ended up making eye contact with a dirty man lurking in an alleyway. I quickly averted my eyes to my flip-flops and kept walking. After a few blocks, the crowd thinned out, and I was feeling less on edge. In fact, I was actually starting to enjoy my walk. At that point, I noticed this van. It was parked across the street trying to look inconspicuous. I saw the driver even slide down his seat as I walked by, as if he was trying to avoid being seen. I couldn't make out the details very well, but I could see it was an older man with a darker complexion and short black hair. Trying not to stare for too long, I committed this stereotypical creeper van to my memory. It was white with tinted windows and no company markings, no front driver's license plate either. Red flags were going off in my head. I pushed away the feeling though. I walked another block or two. When I came to notice the same van creeping up a side street nearby, I got a nervous chill. I pressed on, trying my best not to look frightened. The van disappeared out of sight, but after another couple of blocks, I noticed it coming up again. I didn't like where this situation was heading, so I stood my ground and faced the van straight on. I stared into the man's face, waiting to see his reaction to me noticing him. To my horror, he immediately got out of the van, slamming the door behind him. He was a short Hispanic man, I would say 5'4", about 160 pounds, shorter than me but definitely bigger. My mind was racing as he began to run across the road toward me. I was frozen to the spot. I wasn't expecting this. As soon as he reached me, he started speaking in broken English. I could mostly understand him. He complimented me, saying he liked my hair, piercings, freckles, and my ass was the most enjoyable. I felt extremely uncomfortable. At this point, I awkwardly thought he was going to proposition me for sex. I nearly choked on my spit when he did and asked him to repeat himself, not sure if I was hearing him correctly. He pulled out $200 from his wallet and offered it to me if I would have sex with him. I took a step back, harshly telling him I was not that kind of girl, and he was barking up the wrong tree. I tried to turn around. As I did so, he grabbed my ass. I then sped walk away from this man, trying my best not to panic. The man followed me, waving his $200 around like it would convince me to go back with him. I ran to the first door I saw and yanked it open. As soon as I rushed in, I ran directly into a bouncer. I fell back on my ass with a yelp. The bouncer helped me up and asked me why I was in such a hurry. I was still in shock at this point, and he asked to see my ID. I looked around and realized I'd stumbled into a pub. I told him on the verge of tears that I was only 19, and I was trying to hide from a man who was following me outside. I was practically having a panic attack, as the bouncer guided me into the bar and fetched me a glass of water. The bouncer wanted a description of the man. 
he told me to hang on tight and disappeared out the door. After a few long minutes of waiting, he returned and told me the man would not be a problem anymore. I was still reasonably frightened though. The bouncer asked me where I was heading. I checked the GPS on my phone. I was only two blocks away from my boyfriend's job. The bouncer kindly clocked out on his break and offered to walk me the two remaining blocks there. I latched onto the man's arm, thanking him profusely. He laughed and patted me on my head. He told me never to walk down Colfax Avenue alone again. I promised him I would not repeat this mistake. When we arrived at my boyfriend's job, I thanked the bouncer again and sent him on his way. I explained what happened to my boyfriend and he laughed at me. Perhaps I deserved that, but no one had warned me of the particular dangers of that road. I ended up not taking him to dinner that night and I never walked that street alone again. Before I begin, I would like to preface this by stating I am a 23-year-old female, and I currently attend a graduate school in the Midwest. Earlier this year, I attended a research conference in Orleans with four other grad students in my academic program. In order to save some money, all of us decided to rent out an Airbnb for the duration of the conference instead of finding a hotel to stay in. We ended up finding a really nice studio apartment about a mile away from downtown New Orleans. The apartment was rather small and contained two queen-sized beds as well as a futon. Our party was four girls and one guy. I shared one of the beds with my friend Anna, and the two other girls, Megan and Katie, shared the other bed. The last student, Ari, ended up having the futon all to himself. We decided to hit up downtown shortly after unpacking and settling our things into the Airbnb. After exploring the area and hitting up a few bars, we decided to head back and call it a night. We had to be present at the conference early the next morning. All of us hit the sack shortly after returning back to the Airbnb. I remember waking up a couple of hours later, though, to a suspicious creaking sound. Well, at first I thought it was nothing, but then I saw the apartment's doors slowly open and a man in a black hoodie come sneaking inside. I allowed the panic to set in and immediately woke Anna. As she woke up, I pointed out the man. He was slowly creeping towards us. Anna asked me who that was. I don't know, I responded. She got out of bed to get a better look at the guy. Can we help you? She called out. The man just stood there in silence. He then made his way over to Megan and Katie's bed, who were both fast asleep still. He proceeded to climb on top of them. My heart was now racing faster than ever, but I couldn't move. I was paralyzed in fear. Ari, why are you in our bed? I heard Katie groan. Then Megan woke up and yelled, What are you doing? Get out of here! Megan, that's not Ari, I said in a trembling voice. He was still asleep on the futon, despite all the commotion. The man was basically on top of Megan and Katie, who were screaming hysterically at this point, desperately trying to get him off. I told Anna to wake Ari up, and she immediately ran over to him and started shaking him profusely. I heard her begging him to wake up, saying there was a man in their bed right now and he needed to help us. Still half asleep, he began to rouse. I got out of bed and grabbed my phone. I dialed 911 and told the operator to send help as soon as possible. While I was on the phone, Ari got up and turned on the lights. He ran over and shoved the man off of Katie and Megan. Get off them! He yelled and threw the man to the ground. I managed to get a better look at the intruder once the lights were on. He was bald and had this very thick beard. He was also missing several teeth. He just began to cackle and laugh hysterically once he was on the ground. Megan and Katie both huddled together in the corner of the apartment, while Anna stood behind Ari. We were all very frightened. 
Once the police arrived, they gathered all our information and escorted this mystery man out of the apartment. Needless to say, the frightening and traumatic experience pretty much ruined our stay in New Orleans. I still have nightmares about it to this day. Please make sure to keep your doors locked and double check them. You never know who might want to stop by for a nightly visit. A few days ago, I came home from work and spent some time playing with my kids in the front yard. I live in a typical little suburb with very little crime at all. At about 8.45 p.m., it was starting to get pretty dark and it was about time for them to head to bed. We started gathering up all the frisbees, balls, and toys. At some point, my daughter entered the garage and I went in after her. My son, who was 11 years old, remained outside on the driveway, right by the sidewalk. It must have only been about 10 seconds that he was out of my sight. All of a sudden, this dark car swooped in out of nowhere and stopped right by my mailbox just feet away from my son. I was distracted in the garage and had not seen it in the moment. I rushed outside when I heard the car, and in the instant the driver saw me, he accelerated at 60 miles an hour out of there. It all happened so quickly. Why did he stop when he saw my son all alone and then escape immediately when he saw it was me? Maybe it was just a lost driver, but I really think someone was out prowling to try and snatch a kid that night. I don't want to be paranoid, but TV is full of true crime shows but people saying things like this never happened before in our town. Well, now I know it can happen anywhere. Four years ago, I remember training a new worker, who honestly seemed like a very nice guy at the time. Early 30s, seemingly very healthy, very much into yoga, he had a beautiful girlfriend, the whole works. He seemed very balanced and healthy. His name was Andrew. We had another long-time co-worker who was sort of Mr. Popular with the managers, but honestly very personally annoying. People could only take so much of him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job in freestyle and do extremely annoying things all the time. Anyway, his name was Brad. Now, before I explain this, I should include that this workplace really sucks. It barely holds a single star in rating. Indeed, it's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, long hours. It was very hard on most people's health, me included. Anyway, roughly a year into Andrew's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friendly with one another. We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things, but something was really out of place when he mentioned these new beliefs he had. Something about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him, who used to be so rational. I sort of shrugged it off and thought it was probably just a phase. Fast forward a few weeks. Andrew had seemingly started to take a lot of interest in that co-worker Brad and sort of developed some of his mannerisms. He of course did it in a more endearing way, copying his silly dances but doing it in a way that it seemed harmless and everyone was in on the fun. As months went by, though, he started to dance more and more, to the point he had to be asked to stop by supervisors. He would even be doing so at the morning meetings, starting to use all the same mannerisms and phrases as Brad. Needless to say, this really started to creep Brad out, to the point where he asked to switch shifts. We theorized that maybe Andrew had gotten hooked on something, but he was very vocal against all substance use, including alcohol and even weed. He was also a stern vegan. 
Where things really started to change for the worse, though, is when Brad ended up getting with a new hire at work. She became his girlfriend, and they moved in together. At this point, Andrew started showing up to work using Brad's name, even signing himself in on the logbook as him, and referring to himself as Brad. Later that day, Andrew even stood on top of a work table, screaming that Brad was stealing his girlfriend and that he loved her so much. He spread his arms out in a Jesus cross formation, his face to the ceiling. The whole place was silent. After that, he grabbed a broom and kept sweeping at nothing for the next several hours in the corner. He would not turn around from the corner at all, not even when tapped on the shoulder or called by name. The only time I saw him move away from there was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones to leave as well. Despite both of us being the very last in the building, I did my best to act normal while passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him, and he was staring directly at me, his head tilted and making a snarling dog-like face. The next day, our boss decided Andrew needed to go to the hospital. We made an appointment and got him an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guards, who I was friends with, told me that Andrew would keep showing up in the middle of the night, trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 or 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, Andrew came back and seemed completely normal again. He seemed to have no recollection of anything he'd done in the meantime either. He even said he'd written an entire album on his phone in that time, which was surprisingly better than I thought it would be. I noticed it was all love lyrics and wacky country love songs. Things seemed to be returning back to normal. As time went on, he started to really want to hang out with me. You know, go for a hike, throw some axes at trees and stuff. I sort of didn't agree or disagree. I told him I'd get back to him on that, as I was secretly a bit on edge about his constantly changing personality. He asked me later in the day if I was still down to go, and I said unfortunately I had other obligations. Ah oh man, well I guess now I can't throw the axe at your face then. I laughed, not really knowing how to react to that. I told the manager about it, and he just kind of scratched his head uncomfortably and shrugged his shoulders. What was he supposed to do? Apparently, Andrew ended up finding Brad's address due to a work get-together where everyone was invited. Someone had leaked it to Andrew. He started to find weird rocks and sticks and formations on their doorstep, all little shrines or something. We all collectively knew it was Andrew. At some point, they even found Andrew looking in through their windows at night, stalking around their home. He was scratching them with his nails, calling out Brad's name repeatedly, whispering, Brad, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager decided to take action and fired Andrew. Four years later now, Andrew still stalks Brad's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. He uses a new name each time, and a different selfie. He always messages each and every one of us as well. It's always the same. Hey, I know it's been a while. It's Brad from work. I guess my question is, what would this behavior even be called? How did such a normal, likable, and level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? What would the diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply once if he recalled anything, which he didn't seem to remember, but he sure remembers Brad's ex-girlfriend and always says some extremely concerning things. The most concerning being how she's the only one he'll ever have. He even said he was put on this earth to save her. He seemingly has no support at all from family or anything and is now working a new job living alone and unattended. I feel like this is a huge risk. I'm interested in knowing if there's anything I can do. Do you have any feedback on what you might be dealing with?
This story isn't one of mine, but it was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy, gated community. It's in Orange County, California. We always visit each other often, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime there is something that's virtually non-existent. If it does exist at all, Typically, it's domestic violence within a household. I'm now 32, and my parents are in their mid-60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was always locked. It was like their own personal religion. I always question this policy. What's the point of locking all the doors and windows when we live out in such an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have the key and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house or wait five hours in the yard just to be able to get into my own home. It was quite annoying whenever those occasions happened. Anyway, one night, around one or two years ago, I think, my parents awoke to someone pounding on their door at around 2 a.m., after having fallen asleep watching SNL, my dad was suddenly awoken. My dad went to answer the door, thinking it was probably my sister or I needing some help. He opened the door without looking through the peephole and was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old man outside instead. The kids started yelling at my dad that he needed to get the hell out of the house. My dad told them he must be confused because this was their house, not whoever this kid was. My mom was in the other room, hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad was arguing with a very frustrated and angry guy to no avail. It was starting to escalate fast. The kid simply could not fathom the logic that this house wasn't his, and my dad had no way to convince him otherwise. Let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He's been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he's always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing the yard work. Let's just say he's much stronger than even I am, as evident whenever we worked on cars together. After five minutes of this circular logic, the kid just suddenly went into a fit of rage. He barged his way into the house and got into a scuffle with my dad. My dad started punching and kicking the kid and was taking many blows to the head himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid back outside and close and lock the door. At this point, the kid went absolutely nuts. He went around the entire house, circling, pounding, and banging on every door and window. My parents were scared shitless. They were terrified he was going to break through a window or bust down a door. He was pounding so hard. At this time, my parents decided to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents were completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves. If this kid was able to break in, my mom was terrified because they could never tell where he was going to attempt to enter next. I remember her telling me how amazed she was that the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with some extreme force and really trying to get in. The cops finally arrived. They found the kid in the backyard trying to pick the lock on one of the back doors. They had to tase the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints as well. After a while, they were able to figure out what exactly happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door, but the older brother had decided to pawn it off on his little brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the home, but was so high he got confused as to what house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding heavily in several places and bruised elsewhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press felony charges, but my parents were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. Personally, I thought they were being a bit too nice in the situation, but I guess it's their choice. 
my family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home, even with religiously locked doors and windows in a gated community, was very upsetting to them psychologically. The after-effects of this ordeal was pretty apparent. They came out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive high-tech security system within only a week of the event. I could tell they were really rattled for a while. They didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not have been able to overtake the high kid. Oh, yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother lived with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents' house and the house they were supposed to be sitting During the summer of 2014, my parents had left for a weekend trip to Cape Cod. I was 16 and in great physical shape from boxing, baseball, and basketball. So, big deal, my mom had made some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up and eat whenever. And I had some money if I wanted to order pizza. Things were all good the first night I was alone. I stayed up until 3 o'clock in the morning, playing Xbox and doing whatever I wanted. I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1 o'clock. I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone, I kind of go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes when I suddenly heard the front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, and it's pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze in shock. I obviously was supposed to be alone. I waited for about two minutes, ears straining to hear anything else. There was nothing. I figured maybe it was just the wind, or maybe my parents had arrived home early for some reason. I turned off the shower and wrapped my towel around myself. I slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. The staircase to the kitchen is pretty tight and walled in. It's essentially like walking down a tunnel that's perpendicular to the kitchen, so I couldn't really see what was waiting for me. When I walked down, though, my house is old as shit, and each step of the stairs makes a super loud creak. Still, I took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took a whole 45 seconds walking down just 12 of the stairs. When I got to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner into the kitchen, I took a deep breath to compose myself. In my mind, I knew I was just being stupid. Obviously, there would not be anything in the kitchen. There was no way I wouldn't have heard another noise from a burglar, who at any rate would have no reason to be in there anyway. After mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I chuckled for being so stupid and just normally walked down the last two stairs. I turned the corner into the kitchen, only to see that standing about two feet away from me, right in the middle, was this towering skeleton of a man. He was dressed all in black, staring at me, perfectly still with a massive smile across his face. I just remember him staring at me. The thing I remember most vividly, though, wasn't his face or his smile, but his arms. They were pointed forward, but he was rotated to the point where they were almost completely reversed. I don't really know how to explain it, but I remember it so well. It was just the most demonic position I'd ever seen. He bore a striking resemblance to someone you'd see in a movie getting possessed or something. That's the only way I can really explain it. To be honest, I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back, I realize how creepy the situation was, but in the moment, I was so frightened that I took a step forward and punched him as hard as I could in the face. It knocked him right to the ground the second the blow connected. I ran up the stairs so fast the towel around my waist floated to the floor, 
leaving me completely naked. At this point, my heart was beating out of control. I managed to make it to my bedroom and locked the door behind me. I slammed a chair up against the doorknob to be safe. I called 911 immediately, in tears, telling the operator of my situation. I sat on the floor in a fetal position, staring at the door and praying the cops would get there soon. I noticed the stream of light poking through the gap between the door and the floor had stopped. Standing outside my door was this mystery intruder. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. Simply put, I was terrified and paralyzed with fear. I watched the shadow across the bottom of the door shift back and forth. I stayed balled up, staring at that gap and praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator kept asking, Hello? Sir? Are you there? I didn't want to make a sound. Even if I wanted to lift the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually, the light flooded the door gap again, and I heard the faintest of footsteps creaking down the wooden stairs. It was silent for a few minutes as I just laid there curled up, unable to move a muscle. Nowadays, I make sure to check every lock in the house before going to bed. I still get nightmares about that occasionally, and my heart races whenever I see someone standing still. I guess I'm doing a pretty alright all things considered though. The police never found out the identity of the person who intruded upon our house. That fact sends shivers down my spine. Every time I look outside, I half expect to see him standing across the street, smiling under a light post or something. To give a little context, I used to work at an apartment complex. As a result, I've had my fair share of creepy encounters. Most residents keep to themselves and don't cause any issues, about 95% or so. The other 5% take up almost all the time. Isaac was one of those 5%. When he first rented out his apartment, he definitely had stoner vibes but he was nice enough and passed the background check quite easily. Almost immediately, however, he started causing some real issues. The lady next door complained that she could smell his smoke constantly. The guy downstairs complained he could hear his stereo at all hours of the day and night. Another resident accused him of following him home one night. The police were there regularly breaking up fights between him and his girlfriends. We caught him hiding two large dogs in his apartment, and he regularly let them run loose, which ultimately resulted in another dog and two people getting attacked. He even accidentally discharged a gun once. Needless to say, he was causing a lot of issues. At first, he was very apologetic and said he would make an effort to remedy all these problems, but things just kept getting worse and after a year of weekly calls and notices from the office, he eventually became standoffish. One morning, I received a call from Isaac, letting me know he'd broken up with one of his girls, and she refused to leave. He asked me to personally come up and remove her myself. I'm a small woman, so even if I wanted to take the risk, I physically wouldn't be capable of wrestling an angry girl out of his apartment. I suggested he call the police instead. He then asked if I could make a maintenance man come up to remove her. I offered to call the police on his behalf, but Isaac said he didn't want to involve them and hung up. A few hours later, Isaac came down to the office with a jump drive and said he needed to print out a 50-page document. Residents weren't technically allowed to use our office printer, but on the rare occasion someone asked to, I usually would not say no. It was an easy way to build a good rapport, but between Isaac becoming such a problem tenant and how large this particular document was, I told him I could not do that. I gave the excuse that our paper toner slash print history was monitored and we would get in trouble for printing such a large document for him. Not liking my answer, 
He started screaming at me about how it was bullshit. He accused me of being useless, bringing up my refusal to fight his ex, and said I was power tripping. He called me a bitch multiple times and said he was going to bring me down a peg. I was pretty over him at this point and told him that if he was going to behave like a child that he needed to leave. He told me that I couldn't make him. I bluntly told him he would leave or I would call the police and have him removed. I also told him I would ban him from the office going forward. Normally, I tried to kill the residents with kindness, but his lease was ending in a week and I didn't care anymore if he hated me. My threat seemed to work. He angrily threw my stuff all over the place and then slammed both doors hard as he left. To my surprise, the following morning, a cop was waiting for me when I got to work. He asked if I knew Isaac, and I confirmed that he was a resident there. He explained that the body of a teen had been discovered the day before, and Isaac was the prime suspect. He was the last person to text the kid, asking him to meet up where the body was found shortly after the message. The police believed that Isaac had been paid to kill him. Based on the timing of the text and when the boy was discovered, Isaac would have had to have left my office and gone directly there. Ultimately, the police wanted to use Isaac's move-out day as an opportunity to catch him. To nobody's surprise, he did not show up. When I walked into his apartment to inspect for damages, of which there was quite a lot, I found a bank receipt from the day of the murder. Someone had wired him $20,000. I thankfully never saw Isaac again. He was caught in another country a few months later and is now serving time in prison. Many years ago, I remember one night I was leaving the bar around 3 a.m. or so, the regular closing time where I lived. I lived out in the country back then and would drive about an hour into the small city to go out on the weekends. As I was leaving the bar, my gas light went off. I knew it was a long drive home, so I had to stop and get some gas before I hopped on the interstate to go back. I waited until I got a bit closer to the interstate on-ramp to stop at a gas station nearby. The station I pulled into was in itself closed, but the pumps were still operating with the credit card. The lights were on, but the store was not open. I pulled up to the pump, when all of a sudden, three men came charging out from behind the back of the building. They started running right for my car. Thank God I hadn't turned it off, because I got back inside and hit that gas pedal as hard and fast as I could. I flew right out of there. I drove onto the interstate and just hoped I had enough gas to make it to the next exit. I got off at the very next one and stopped at the nearest gas station. I filled up there, but the entire time I was on high alert, I was shaking still. I have no idea what was going on or what was happening, but that was truly one of the most terrifying experiences of my entire life. I'm a 25-year-old woman, and when my wife Julie and I were planning our wedding, we were immediately drawn to a Hawaiian honeymoon. The sun, the sand, the tropical resort and turquoise water, it all seemed so dreamy and perfect. We even planned our wedding around a beach on mainland US as a way of prepping for that bliss. It went really smoothly, and Julie and I were very happy surrounded by our friends and family. Before we go into the honeymoon itself, here's a little backstory. I actually met Julie in a scuba diving tour of sorts. She offered to be my diving buddy, and we've been looking after each other ever since, really. When we found a few scuba diving tours near our honeymoon resort, we didn't hesitate to make a few reservations. That's how we found ourselves just off the southern coast of Molokai on a bright sunny day. The group consisted of our diving instructor, 
a couple of other young guys on vacation, Julie and I and an older man. It was a fairly modest group, but sometimes those were more relaxed because there were less people for the diving instructor to keep track of. Together, we all went out to the appropriate depth, the only sound being the chatter between us and the roar of the boat as its engine revved. We all finished putting on our gear as the instructor went through his speeches about sticking to your diving buddy and not to resurface too quickly. All the standard safety stuff. Out of the blue, the older man on board turned to Julie and asked if she'd be his diving buddy. Julie looked at me confused and laughed uncomfortably. Um, actually, my wife and I already planned to go together, but you're welcome to join us if you want, I guess. The man's face suddenly twisted into a mask of anger. I could even see the tips of his ears turning bright red as he spoke. Well, it was more like just below yelling. You're a slur. You shouldn't even be here. I immediately spoke up. Well, what the hell is that supposed to mean? He opened his mouth to reply, but the instructor interjected before he could say anything else. Hey, I don't tolerate that kind of behavior on my dives. If you don't want to be taken back to shore, you better start behaving now, sir. We sighed, grateful for the help in de-escalating the situation, but we were also incredibly embarrassed that it happened in the first place. Even on our honeymoon, we'd somehow managed to find someone like that. While the man busied himself with getting ready, Julie and I checked each other over and told ourselves we were still going to have a fantastic dive and an even better honeymoon. The instructor gave the go-ahead, and altogether we flipped over backwards into the cool blue void. It had been quite a while since we'd been diving. I got a bit disoriented, but Julie grabbed my hand and I steadied myself. Though I couldn't see her face through the thick scuba gear, I could tell she would smile if her mouthpiece let her. I remember the water near the surface was a crisp blue expanse that never seemed to end. A familiar sensation of floating was taking over. Below us lay a reef. There's no other word to describe it but simply majestic. The coral sprawled onward like a big plant-like apartment complex, all different spectrums of colors. And speaking of colors, the sea life swimming around was just as much a rainbow. From the small fish picking at the coral all the way up to the small reef sharks stalking above them, the whole thing was just taking my breath away, and being there with my love made it all better. We swam next to each other for a while, exploring the area and seeing everything it had to offer. The rest of the group had split up to do their own thing. The two inexperienced guys were staying more near the surface, getting used to the feeling of being underwater, while the older man was presumably sticking close to the diving instructor, since he didn't appear to have a partner. I can't say I wasn't happy to not be near him. The further away he was, the better. I signaled to Julie I was going to check out some of the sharks a bit farther away. Not a big fan of that one, was she? I left her for a minute to do her own thing, while still making sure we were well within sight of each other, as per diving rules. I'd only be away from her for a second or two. Well, a second is all it took. I just about reached the area I wanted to explore when I felt something slam into me so hard it almost pushed my respirator out. I clenched my teeth to keep that thing in there and looked around. I thought I'd been hit by a shark being curious or something, but that quickly went out the window when a hand grabbed my arm from underneath me and tried to tug me down. I was nearly being flipped upside down, straining to get a look at what was happening. A person reached for my face, and with horror I realized they were trying to grab my mouthpiece. I couldn't scream, I couldn't think, I could only hang on for dear life with my teeth and pray this person couldn't pry it loose from my mouth. My breathing quickened, bubbles swished by us, fizzing in the struggle. We were attracting attention from the nearby wildlife. One or two sharks even swam up against the person attacking me. They seemed startled by this and batted at the sharks, who carried on as if nothing were happening. 
Thankfully, that was my chance. I lashed out at the person as they were trying to deal with the wildlife, pushing myself away and trying to kick them with my flippers as I swam. Not exactly the most effective, but at least it was something. I immediately swam back to Julie and gestured that we needed to resurface right now. We made our way to the top of the water as quickly as we could, and all I could do was rip off my mask and hug her. We made our way back to the boat and had a chance to talk safely. When she heard that someone had tried to drown me under the water, her eyes darkened and she was more furious than I'd ever seen her. She immediately knew who it had to be, and on some level, so did I. That old man, the one who'd had a problem with us since we started this dive. I was in shock he'd try to kill me over such a petty reason. That's just sick. We sat on the boat with the driver, until it was time for the others to resurface, who were just as horrified as we were. When the man climbed back onto the boat, I felt my stomach drop. I hated the idea of sitting with him all the way back to dry land. When he pulled off his mask and saw me staring and Julie glaring, his eyes got really, really wide. Julie immediately went off on the guy, calling him a sick bastard for trying to kill her wife and screaming that he'd tried to kill me. The instructor got between us to try and sort out the situation, and when I gave my statement about him trying to pull out my breathing tube and holding me underwater, the instructor got out his phone and dialed the police. The two young guys held the man down as we quickly headed to shore, where the authorities were waiting to question me and seemingly arrest him. I know it sounds anticlimactic, but it all got settled out of court. He ended up being related to the head of the police force in some way. That in itself is terrifying, but it's even more terrifying he would think to just kill someone so casually for not aligning with his personal worldview. Julie and I didn't go scuba diving for the rest of our trip because we were worried something like that might happen again. Maybe we'll go out one day because you can't spend the rest of your life in fear, but we'll be much, much more vigilant. I've been a long-time reader of scary stories, so it's honestly kind of surreal that I now find myself writing about an experience I had very recently. It was a Friday night, and I had gone to bed early, as I had work on Saturday morning. After reading in bed for a bit, I drifted off at around 10.30, only to wake up about an hour later to screaming and people yelling profanities. I thought that my girlfriend was watching a movie with the volume way up and went out into the lounge room to ask her to turn it down a little. Instead, the TV was off and my girlfriend was staring at the front door with her eyes extremely wide. Our apartment is on the ground floor of the building and so our front door opens directly out into the lobby. The voices in question were coming from that area. I couldn't make out specifics. In my defense, I was half asleep, and the language of the country I live in is not my first language. There was a lot of swearing involved, though. My first thought was that some kind of domestic dispute was going on outside, but after listening in closer, I realized it was a group of men that sounded extremely aggressive. I looked at the WhatsApp group chat for my apartment building and saw to my horror a message from one of the people in it. There were armed men in the building and we should not leave our flats no matter what. The country I live in is experiencing a marked uptick in crime and I've heard stories about armed groups of men robbing entire apartment blocks, but those had seemed like fairy tales to me. That was my first thought though that these men would kick down every door and rob us. One of my dogs started to growl at the commotion outside. I shushed him, and thankfully he obeyed. I heard a commotion in the apartment above me and went out to my patio to see what was happening. I heard what sounded like a large piece of furniture being knocked over and women and children screaming in terror. 
At this point, I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that by now they would have robbed us already if that's what they were planning to do. My girlfriend and I decided to hide in a small shed at the end of our patio, monitoring the group chat on our phones. Our bigger dog silently stood outside the door of the shed, keeping watch, his eyes locked on the sliding door at the end of the patio. I found my smaller dog later, cowering between the washing machine and the dryer. After ten extremely tense minutes, I heard the screeching of tires, signaling what I hoped was the perpetrators fleeing the scene. Eventually, someone in the group chat said the police had arrived, and breathing a huge sigh of relief, I came out of hiding and opened the front door. Alarmingly, on the floor of the lobby, there were zip ties that had been cut, and the security guard was talking to one of the tenants. A man was bleeding from a large gash on his face and looked extremely shaken. Over the next few hours, the full story would unfold. The man I saw with the gash on his face was the tenant in the upstairs apartment, the one I heard the commotion coming from. He was the owner of an import-export business and for whatever reason had a sizable amount of money, in cash, hidden in his apartment. Hidden in his apartment. Someone had obviously found out about it and planned out the robbery that woke me from my sleep on that Friday night. A group of eight men had followed him into the apartment building's garage and ambushed him as he got out of the car. Judging from the gash on his face, they roughed him up quite a bit as well. Some of the group of eight had gone to the lobby, surprised the security guard and zip-tied him. The remainder had gone up to the apartment itself, robbed it, and then fled the scene. It's fairly chilling to think a large group of armed men were mere meters from my front door. Hi there, you can call me Clara if you'd like. You know how sometimes you get that gut feeling only to find out later that it was nothing? Well, once, that feeling saved my life. This story took place five years ago. I had just inherited my grandparents' big house. It was beautiful and very spacious. But as I was still in mourning, it was too painful. I didn't want to live there. The house brought back too many memories of them. So, I decided to sell it. I spent a whole weekend there, emptying and cleaning the house so that it would be perfect when the visits began. I did an inventory to make sure everything was in good condition. The lock on the back door of the house which led to the kitchen seemed to be broken and would no longer lock properly. I had to consider changing it soon. I told myself, though, that this particular weekend I already had enough work and I would take care of it the following week. It's not like there was any rush after all. It was a quiet neighborhood with no problems and the house was in no danger. The next day, everything seemed perfect. I cleaned everything from top to bottom. I had three visits scheduled that day for people coming to look at the home. A lovely couple with a baby who ultimately found that the house was too dated for them and they didn't want to have any work to do on it. There were also a couple of retirees who said they were interested, but I could kind of tell they weren't very excited. I didn't expect them to ever call me back if you know what I mean. Then there was the last guy, a man in his 50s. He said he'd come to check it out for his wife and daughter. He asked me lots of questions about the house. I thought to myself, this might be the one. He seems really interested in the property. He noticed the problem with the back door as well, and I told him I would have it fixed within the week. He told me he would call me back soon and that he'd make a second visit with his wife and daughter that time. At the end of the day, I was quite tired, but I was happy to have found a potential buyer. Not having had time to eat lunch, my stomach was really starting to grumble. I decided to go grab something to eat at a nearby fast food restaurant. Before going to bed, I took a hot bath to relax and have a good night's sleep. The day before, I'd slept very badly. It was not my bed or my room, and being the same house of my grandparents' passing gave me quite a lot of grief. I also missed my husband and children. 
After my bath, I headed into the bedroom to put on my clean underwear that I'd previously placed on the bed, but when I arrived, I saw they were no longer there. They were nowhere to be found. I was sure I had put them there, though. I looked around everywhere, until I finally found them neatly placed on the top of the dresser. I told myself that with how tired I was, I must no longer know what I was doing. It was really time for me to get some rest. That night went well and I slept like a baby. The next morning, I started to prepare my things to leave and go home. I had breakfast and decided to have it in the kitchen when I noticed that the back door was slightly ajar. I didn't remember having opened it though. The last time I did that was during my last visit with the man to show him the lock, but I was sure I'd closed it since then. I told myself that since the lock was broken, perhaps it opened by itself with the wind or something. As I sat down to eat though, I suddenly got an extremely bad feeling. You know, the bad intuition that you don't know where it comes from. You don't know how to explain it, but you know deep down that something is very wrong. I thought about that day before, when I'd found my underwear in a different place, and then about the guy who came to visit my house the previous day. I started to think more about the questions he'd asked me. My daughter likes to be very loud when she plays around. Is the house well insulated in terms of noise? I don't want the neighbors to be disturbed. This house is really big. It's great. Do you think there's enough space to play games like hide and seek? I remember at the end of the visit being a mother myself. I asked him how old his daughter was. He took a few moments before answering me. Oh, she's 15. And you know, my daughter likes to invite her friends to do those parties on the weekend. I hope that won't be too much a problem. I didn't think too much of it at the time, but what kind of 15-year-old plays hide-and-seek and screams while playing with toys? I finished eating, feeling more and more perplexed by the moment. I decided to leave the house as quickly as possible before I got completely paranoid. I tried to put things into perspective and reassure myself. I had a long way to go home, though, so I decided to go upstairs one last time to use the restroom before leaving. Just before I did so, though, I got an odd feeling that perhaps saved my life. For no reason at all except to reassure myself, I left out of the main door, locking it as if I was going to leave. I then re-entered the home through the broken kitchen door discreetly, and suddenly stopped in my tracks. I heard someone running down the stairs. Suddenly, I saw the man from the day before, with knife in hand. Ah, shit, he yelled, banging his fist against the main door. From where he was, he couldn't see me. I was now totally panicked, my heart pounding. I don't even know how to describe the intensity of the fear I felt at that moment, but I'll remember it for my whole life. My survival instinct took over, and I decided to exit once more without making any noise. Once outside, I ran to my car. I drove and parked two blocks away and called the police while constantly looking around. I was afraid that even though I had my car, the guy would somehow catch up to me. A few minutes later, I went back, and the police were already there. No trace of the man. He had already run away. After that, I quickly had the kitchen door repaired. I changed the lock on the front door just in case, and installed a security camera as well. I took care to be accompanied by my husband or friends every time I made visits to the house, and I ended up selling it soon after. Today, this story is far behind me, but I was scared for my life, and I had insomnia and nightmares for months and months after. I keep telling myself, if I hadn't had that sudden urge to pretend to leave the house before going up to the toilet, I would have died because that psycho was waiting for me upstairs with a knife in his hand. I'd say to trust your instincts, in the worst case you end up looking silly, but just in case they're right, they won't deceive you. They've saved me more than once. Hi there, 
I would like to first clarify that obviously all the names used in this story are assumed names to maintain anonymity. My name will be Mary. I find it important to tell what happened to me because it could raise awareness of other people who may be in the same situation I was. It's first important for me to clarify that I'm a very responsible girl. I'm very well organized and on point in everything I do. I have a routine, and I hate doing anything outside of it. A few years ago, I met a man in a bar, and it was love at first sight on both sides. We'll call him Sebastian. I really thought that Sebastian was the one for me, and that for him, I was his woman as well. I felt something indescribable for him. We got together very quickly, and I directly introduced my friends and family to him. He never seemed to want to do it, though. I never met any of his friends or family, but honestly, that didn't bother me that much. I could understand why he didn't want to rush. We'd only been together for a few days, after all. I didn't know anyone around him, though. We had no friends in common, nothing, really. All our dates without exception took place at my house, because he lived in the suburbs a little over an hour away, and I didn't have a license at the time. Because of this, it was always him coming to me. One day, a little after a week after we made ourselves official, he was over at my house as usual. I don't remember why I decided to do this, but I went outside to clear my mind a bit. I still think this was possibly a sign from a guardian angel or something. As I said at the beginning of the story, it's something that very rarely ever happened to me. A time when I didn't stick to my usual routine to the letter, but today I felt the need to take a sudden walk. I asked Sebastian to accompany me, but he refused. I ended up going out alone. Everything went well, until I came across a kitten underneath a car. Worried for the little rascal, I immediately tried to grab him so he wouldn't run out and be run over by a car or something. I managed to get him out safely, and seeing that he didn't have a collar on him, I took him with me. We were in a neighborhood where cats tended to run away and disappear a lot, so we always used a WhatsApp group, which allowed us to ask or give information about cats that had disappeared. I took the cat home to try and find its owner but you should know that my phone had a broken rear and front camera, so I couldn't take photos at the time of the little kitten I'd found. I thought directly of Sebastian. I asked him for a favor, and he agreed to lend me his phone for a moment, so I could send the photos of the cat to the WhatsApp group, where I could find out if it was someone's lost pet. He went to the bathroom, and during this time I took a photo of the little kitten. Being a woman by nature somewhat curious and very guarded, I told myself that now was the time or never to search through the phone. Everything seemed to be going too good, too rosy to be true. I was convinced that he was cheating on me, but I was far from imagining what was really occurring. I started digging through his Instagram. How strange. He had several accounts, including the one he'd added me on by the name of Sebastian. There were many others, though, with different names. Paul, Ludovic, Esteban. I was convinced he really was cheating on me. I took a look deeper, and what I found in that moment turned my stomach and scarred me violently and above all for life. In his messages, there were around 20 photos shared of me to another unnamed number, all of them taken well before we'd met, and all of them in candid circumstances. My clear routine was photographed and well-established and sent to this mystery person. I immediately understood he must have been following me and observing me for several weeks without my knowledge. At that moment, I felt a horrible terror of having to confront him once he emerged from the bathroom. When he came out, I immediately felt that he was going to notice something was wrong, but he didn't seem to have caught on at all. He eventually left, and the first thing I did was call the police. Unfortunately, I had no way to prove what I had just seen. Upon arriving at the station and telling them everything I knew, the police promised to try and investigate, but they weren't sure they would even be able to find him now that I knew that Sebastian was not his real identity. 
Moreover, the address he'd given me as his home address was a place inhabited by retirees, not a young person in his 30s. I didn't go home for a week after. I stayed at my best friend's house instead, and I blocked Sebastian everywhere. A week later, I learned that he had been found, and that this man, whose name was not Sebastian at all, was suspected of sex trafficking. He was currently awaiting trial. I moved as quickly as I could. He was sentenced to many years in prison after a thorough search of his phone and computers. I never really recovered from this event, and I'm even more paranoid than I already was. Above all, I wonder what would have happened to me had I not done something different than my routine and not encountered that little savior kitten in the street. Be careful of your surroundings and make sure to check out who you associate with. For some context, my name is Leo, and I'm 23 years old. I live in a studio apartment in a very recently built and well-secured residence. There's three doors with badges and codes and all that stuff before you're even able to enter the building. The neighborhood itself is quite popular. This story is relatively recent since it happened to me just last Friday, December 10th. If I get any episode 2s of this story or anything, I'll update this post in the future. Friday evening, I was having a little outing with my new girlfriend to the Christmas market. We ate something in town and went home. At one point, in a joking tone before bed, I said something stupid like, If you're not happy, why don't you go home? She joined in the game by pretending to leave, but instead shut the door and came right back. Instinctively, I checked to make sure the door was closed, because while speaking with her, I didn't hear her close it all the way. For some reason, I had a feeling that I needed to do something I usually never would do. I locked it. We already had so much security, and I'd always lived in places or apartments which did not have outside locks anyway, and only opened with the key. Anyway, after that, we ended up falling asleep around midnight. It's from there that things started to get a bit eerie. Around 2.40 or 2.50, we were both awoken by the sound of the doorbell ringing. The first time, it woke me up, and I emerged slowly, wondering what was going on. My girlfriend was still bouncing in and out of sleep, and told me to go open the door and see who it was. She was so out of it, she thought it was 9am, and that it was a neighbor that might need something. The ringing continued more and more excessively, as if the person on the other side knew that someone was there. I was starting to wonder what the hell was going on, and my girlfriend was starting to wake up more and more. After a minute or two, I decided to look discreetly through the peephole in the door. I told my girlfriend to be as quiet as possible and not make any noise. I tried not to make any noise either, while the person continued to ring on the other side. Right as I reached it, I suddenly got a feeling of being really scared. I put my hand on the door and was just about to open the peephole to look through when someone started scratching at the peephole area. At that time, I was extremely scared. I snuck back to bed and tried to think of what to do. The doorbell ringing was getting more and more erratic and the scratching was too. They also started to knock and tap in multiple places. To be safe, I decided to just call the police. The noises immediately quieted down. I explained in whispers on the phone that someone was ringing and scratching at my door, and they were really scaring me and my girlfriend. The noises became even more eccentric after I said that. I was told the police were going to stop by. I explained that because of the way they were erratically behaving, I was worried the person would become violent and I did not know how to let the police enter the complex discreetly without being attacked by them. After hanging up, the person started playing with the doorbell even more. This time, they'd press it for a few seconds to make a long ding and then release it to make the dong, tapping in different places on the door and windows. My girlfriend was panicking, and I did my best to reassure her. 
I told her the police were on their way, and nothing would happen to us. I had noticed a detail, though, that really unsettled me. The light out in the hallway was off, but the noises were still ongoing. Thing is, there was a light detector right outside my front door, which was really sensitive. If there was someone moving out there, it should have gone off. This person must have been standing motionless in front of my door in complete silence, scratching and ringing while making sure not to set it off. In the meantime, I opened the shutters as quietly as possible to check for the arrival of the police. The noises quieted down for a good quarter of an hour, when all of a sudden for a good minute, the person outside suddenly started hammering on the wall right next to my bed. After that, there was nothing more. I got one last scare, though, when I saw a car stopping outside and a young woman around 20 years old getting out none the wiser and heading toward the suspicious area. I grabbed a long knife in my hands from the kitchen, and then I went out to try and warn her about the suspicious circumstances. Fortunately, she returned without any problems, and there were no attacks from this mysterious person. About ten minutes later, I saw a police car arriving. My intercom rang, and I opened the doors to the police. I explained to them what I just explained to you. They went around all the floors to check and make sure no one was there before leaving. The police asked me if I'd had any problems with people who wanted to scare or hurt me. Absolutely none. They also asked me if it couldn't be a drunk neighbor who had the wrong apartment, possibly. I mean, that does seem like something that could have happened. But, in my opinion, someone who has the wrong apartment will at least try to put their keys in the lock. Not once had there been a sound of the person outside trying to do that. Usually, they would also try to call out to the person they thought was inside, you know, so-and-so, open up the door, I forgot my keys. There was not even the sound of breathing. No footsteps, not a single word, nothing. I talked about it on my Facebook group at my residence. No one else was woken up by someone ringing their doorbell, but some people around us definitely heard the hammering blows. On top of that, I noticed a post from a few months ago in the group, a description of a strange, mysterious man who would come in at the same time as other people and always skulk about the building. I wish I had looked through the peephole to see if they matched the description in that post. I got too scared when the person started scratching at the peephole, though. I haven't slept well since. What's certain is that if it happens to me again, I'll buy a mini camera straight away. Now, I always make sure everything is double locked. Fortunately, nothing serious happened, but I still get shivers down my spine, just imagining what would have happened if I hadn't made sure that the door was locked, and that it was closed properly after our little joke earlier in the evening. Good evening, my name is Rose. I'm 18 years old, and the story I'm about to tell sends shivers down the spine of everyone that hears it, at least in my experience. It was two years ago, when I was 16. I was going for a walk with a friend from our village, not far from home. We loved going into the forest and lying down in the grass for hours. In short, we loved nature. That day, we decided to go to the forest from around 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., then go out to the field for a picnic. Then all afternoon, we would go to places in the forest that we hadn't explored yet. You should remember that the path to this forest is very busy. Quite a few people were along the walk with us. There was one family with three young children, a couple of hikers, an older gentleman who I think used to come for a walk there every now and then. Once we arrived at the entrance to the forest, there were a lot of people coming back down as well. My friend had noticed one of them looking at us, a tall, dark-haired man, who was randomly eating a pear by cutting it into quarters while walking with a Swiss army knife, always from top to bottom to bring the piece to his mouth. Once he passed by us, the man stopped and whispered to us, Be careful, I saw someone strange walking around with a knife. At the time, we started to get scared. 
I told myself that if hikers came here, it was because they knew the place quite well. I looked at the man and said, Thank you very much for the warning, sir. He gave me a strange smile, as if he had something to hide. Around 10.50 a.m., my friend wanted to stop for a quick drink. We were still on the trail a little further down. Looking around me, I thought I could see a figure a little further down hiding in the bushes. I couldn't really be sure, though. I didn't think much of it. There are a lot of people who go trail running at this time of year, so maybe someone just needed to stop and use the bathroom or something. Fifteen minutes later, we arrived in the field in the middle of the forest. It was really a splendid sight. We decided to stay there until 12.30 to eat and observe the view. During our picnic, I had to do my business. There were a lot of people having lunch at the same time as us, though, so I had to go a little further away and go behind a tree. The position I was in was not really that comfortable. Once I'd finished, I looked up, only to find that right in front of me, standing there silently, was the same man from earlier. Just imagine the scream I let out when I saw that guy. The only thing I thought to myself in that moment was, he must have been watching us from the beginning. He's going to rear me now. He took off running. I found it strange, because when we'd been coming up to this area, he was going down the other way, but he left as if he were going out further into the forest. I ran back to my friend to tell her what I'd just experienced. We started going down the trail again, on guard this time because we were very afraid. Two hours passed by without any sight of the man, though. I'd now seen him three times since our initial arrival. My friend recognized in the distance the old gentleman who had been in front of us earlier on the main road. She decided to call out to him and ask him a question. Uh, hello, sir? There was a guy earlier that told us there was someone in the forest armed with a knife? The man looked at my friend, then at me. Two young girls like you, huh? A perfect target for the man in the forest. Then we really started to freak out. The old man started walking, and we followed behind him. My friend was getting stressed out, taking lots of glances as if she'd seen something, or rather someone. The old man led us to a path, which it turned out led to his house. He advised us of a route we could take from there to get back to safety. I asked him if he could let us into his home while I called my father to come get us, but the man started to panic. If he knows that you entered my house, he'll kill all of us. The path he'd pointed out was a long one before reaching the main road. I told my friend the most stressful word in this kind of situation, run. We started running down the path. As I looked to my side, I saw that out in the forest was the man, running in the same direction as us, but not necessarily running towards us. I took out my phone to call my father, who lived five minutes of driving away from this area. Suddenly, we heard a huge scream of rage. I turned my head towards the guy. The man must have been very upset to see me calling for help. As my dad's car pulled in, though, the individual finally turned around and ran back into the forest. Once in my dad's car, we cried with relief. My father notified the police, who came ten minutes later. It turned out the man with the knife was a repeat therapist who primarily targeted women between the ages of 13 and 25. He was arrested quite quickly. Apparently, the old man was his father. I don't know about his life story, really, but I will remember this for the rest of my life. My friend and I still live in our little village, and we've returned to this forest quite a few times since this incident happened. None of it happened again, of course, but that still doesn't stop us from being a little afraid every time we go out there. Hello, my name is Wilfred. I was told about the existence of a place where you can share strange or frightening encounters, so I'm going to tell you about a horrible event that happened about three years ago now. I lived on the second floor of a building in Nancy with my boyfriend. Unfortunately, at that time, 
Me and my boyfriend were no longer getting along very well, and we decided to take a break. He went to go stay with his family for a few weeks, and I stayed in Nancy alone. If I want to be honest, I was not really handling it well. I was sleeping very little at night, to the point that night and day were almost reversed for me. One evening, I woke up at around 3 a.m. I had slept in all day. I got up and went to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. I put some tea in the pot, and in the meantime, I went out to smoke a cigarette on my terrace. I wasn't even fully awake yet. I was thinking deeply about my romantic situation. At some point, though, I realized that someone was out in the street and talking quite loudly. I didn't really pay it much mind, surely just a passerby who was on the phone. The voice faded until I couldn't hear it anymore. I turned my head back toward the road at some point, only to see the worst thing in my entire life which continues to scare me to this day. There was a man standing in the street, around 50 years old, with what appeared to be a large knife in his hand. He was completely naked, and he was looking at me with these wild bug eyes. It took me a while to really understand what I was seeing here. It seemed so unreal to me that I thought I must be hallucinating. I didn't have time to even react or do anything when he suddenly started yelling at me. He began to scream and insult me and ask what I was doing here. I quickly entered my apartment and closed the door behind me. Even though I lived on the second floor and the man surely couldn't reach me, I still closed and locked it out of reflex. I remember I had never been so startled in my entire life. I even wondered how I hadn't pissed myself because it was so strange and scary. As I came more to my senses, I could still hear him outside screaming at me. The door was closed though, so I couldn't really understand what he was saying. All of a sudden, he stopped screaming. I couldn't hear anything for a short while. Then I began to hear some weird noises, as if he was hitting something. Once again, he began to screech into the air. Needless to say, the situation was very unnerving. At this point, I ran to my room and took my phone to call the police. At the same time as I was on the phone with them, I returned to my living room. I could hear the man screaming outside still. Once again, he stopped suddenly, and there was no more sound except for the sound of one last blow striking. The woman on the phone told me the police were already on their way. One of my neighbors had seemingly called as well. Obviously, he was screaming so loudly, it was waking everyone in the area up. After a few minutes, I saw the flashing lights of police vehicles. Afterwards, I took a few minutes to calm down before going downstairs to see the officers. They were talking with some other neighbors in the hall. When I arrived at the entrance, I saw that the glass door was damaged and there was blood all over it. It was assumed it was the man's, not a victim's, since no one had reported being injured. From what I understood, he must have struck his knife on the window, the noises which I'd heard earlier, which sounded like blows. He'd injured himself with his knife while trying to break in. The last sound I heard was him tossing his knife. Apparently, the neighbors on the first floor found it on their terrace. We think the man must have thrown it at them out of anger, perhaps. When I learned all that, I knew that he really wanted to get inside. For some reason, he was really focused on me, and nobody knew why. I still don't know why he was so mad at me in particular. I had never seen the man before in my life. I explained my version of events to the police, all while crying. The night was super long. I called a friend right after, so he could come pick me up and I could sleep at his place for a time, at least until my boyfriend came back. I heard a few days later from the neighbor who'd found the knife tossed at his home. They'd arrested the man a few streets away. Apparently, the man had some serious psychiatric problems. Without going into too much detail, he'd escaped the vigilance of his family, who would normally monitor him. He was caught threatening a passerby on another street, and now he's been sent to a psychiatric hospital. Even knowing that, though, me and my boyfriend decided to move to another area as quickly as possible. 
Even today, I avoid going back to Nancy, and I had nightmares for almost a year. We still don't know why he was so fixated on me in particular. Some advice for people as well, like the me of before who didn't see a point in going to a therapist after an experience like this. Just go ahead and try it. Honestly, it helped me a lot. Today, I'm clearly less anxious and paranoid than when this happened three years ago. I'm going to tell you a not very funny story that happened to me a few years ago, when I was 18. From my point of view now, it seems even more serious than I thought it was at the time. To begin with, my name is Camille, and I lived in the Paris region at the time this story happened. I had just completed my bachelor's, and was particularly free to do whatever I wanted with my free time, before moving on to higher education. I had one goal, to find a nice guy to stick around with for a while. My big dream in life was to find a nice guy, marry, and have a family with lots of children. I wanted to do it young as well, to be able to live that life as much as possible. It really motivated me to find someone compatible to seriously settle down with as early as I felt comfortable. I registered on a dating site called Grindr. Now, those of you who are familiar with it may say, what a mistake. That's an app on which you can only find people who want sex. Well, I didn't really know that at the time. I remember back then I did a lot of sports and was kind of fit, and apparently other men liked me quite a bit already. I didn't really realize that, though. For me, waking up in the morning with a bunch of notifications from this app was normal. I was very naive back then, maybe a little blind, you might say. I received one message that I remember deciding to reply to. I spoke to this guy for several days. We sent each other photos. It was a crazy match between us. That had never happened with me and another guy before. Small detail. I discovered that I was gay at 18 years old, pretty much overnight without consulting anyone. So, meeting a guy so soon after was pretty crazy. After two weeks, we decided to meet up in person. He sent me his address. He lived in a beautiful suburban area, with very nice individual houses and all that. I went on my way and passed in front of all these beautiful places, each nicer than the other. I told myself deep down that I was kind of embarrassed to be seeing someone so rich. I didn't want to appear as though I was just a gold digger or something. I passed in front of all of the houses when I arrived in front of the number that indicated the address he had given me. I was surprised to find the place was a ruin. The garden wasn't even a garden, it was more of an equatorial forest. There was an invisible house pretty much, hidden amongst all the growing vegetation. I walked around the block a bit and tried to convince myself that this actually was the right place. I sent a message and the man answered immediately and told me that he was already there. Out of this forest, a man well into his 50s and not looking like the photos at all came to open a rickety gate for me to come inside. I told myself, surely this man must be the father of the person I'm talking to. Surely that guy is inside the house. With a big smile, I held out my hand to shake it. He aggressively kissed it with a smile on his face. Not very reassuring. I was very embarrassed and concerned now. The guy told me to follow him through the vegetation, and we arrived at the front door of the house, which was not facing the street, but hidden amongst the side with all the trees and other plants. It was well out of sight from the street view. He opened the door with a loud bang, and I entered behind him. That's where the nightmare really began. The house was almost in complete darkness. The windows were barricaded, with boards nailed to them from the inside. There was so much dust that it formed a curtain with the large webs hanging from the ceiling. The floor was rotten, the walls the same, and above all, the smell was unbearable. It stung my eyes it stunk so much. 
It was not like the kind of smell you'd smell at a public toilet or something, though. It was the questionable smell of organic things rotting for quite some time. At that moment, three cats charged at me, meowing extremely loudly. They were all thin, filthy, and obviously not in good health. All this happened within a manner of seconds. I had just decided to turn around and leave, when the man instantly slammed the door behind me. I saw the door had a system of several bolts attached, in addition to the classic lock. The man locked them up extremely quickly. There was a staircase going upstairs, where the only real light was coming from. It was located immediately to the right of this entrance. The guy waved his hand to invite me in further. The, uh, downstairs is not quite finished yet, but come on. Let's go upstairs. It's renovated up there. I got upstairs and same thing. Everything was disgusting. The only difference is that there was some light. He told me to take the first door on the left and I'd find a big surprise. There, the most incredible thing I'd ever seen happened. I don't know where to start. The window was sealed up and had bars on the outside. There was a mattress on the floor with all these horrible dark brown blankets. Above all, there were shelves on the walls from floor to ceiling with statues of fake Disney characters. This was strangeness beyond what anyone could imagine. I spotted a small chair in the corner of the room, which he forced me to sit on very quietly. From that moment on, I went into survival mode. I smiled big and gave the best attempt at conversation I could for several hours. Beneath the surface, I knew I was in some real trouble. The house was completely barricaded, and even if I was a big, sporty guy, the man in front of me could be armed. How was I to know what he could be hiding? The guy laid down on the mattress and stared at me as we talked, telling me countless times to come join him on the bed. I refused very politely and tried to act innocent, like a guy who understands nothing. After three or four endless hours, I received a message from my roommate, which had a different ringtone than all the other notifications on my phone. I took this opportunity. Damn, I didn't see the time. I have to go home. I have a party tonight. That's my roommate and they're expecting me. I grabbed up my things and told the guy I had to leave right now. They might get concerned if I didn't return quickly. I said we could continue to talk to each other on the app and that in any case we'd see each other again soon. The guy came with me to the front door. I tried to open it to escape, but I couldn't because the door was not locked with a classic locking system. There were all these weird levers and keypads and multiple deadbolts. I couldn't find a way to unlock it. The man fiddled with all the locks, pressed in the codes, and even scanned his fingertip, then said wait, because he had to get an additional key. It took him 15 minutes to come back, 15 minutes where I wondered if I was going to be blasted by a madman who lived here in the middle of hell. He finally opened the door, using three separate keys, and I finally saw the outside again. I ran under his arm, which he'd used to open the door. I crossed through the forest which served as his garden, and jumped the fence right in front of him. I ran and headed home faster than the speed of light. The guy harassed me for months after this meeting, with lots of different phone numbers. Only after many months did he finally stop. Over some time, thinking about it, I told myself that this guy must not even have been the owner of the house. That house was absolutely not being renovated, and it looked like he might have been squatting there. And the smell inside? I've never smelled that smell ever since, except one time when I stumbled across a decomposing hunter's kill in the forest. Without realizing it, my brain made an instant connection to the smell of that home back then, and at that moment I started to panic. The house smelled like corpses. I regret not having been aware of it at the time. I would have called the police straight away, if for nothing else than to check to make sure nothing more serious had happened in that house. No one takes me seriously when I tell this story, so I decided to share it here. 
The backstory is long, but I swear it's important. A few years ago, I was 17. I'd just graduated from high school and got my first job at a Christian camp near Yosemite in California over the summer. Mainly, the people I worked with were great, really sweet Christian college kids, the good kinds. There was one guy, though, who I'll call Carl, who quite frankly unsettled me. He was tall, handsome, and charming. He had curly golden brown hair and a smile that could stop your heart. His eyes, though, were completely dead. He would never get those little crinkles in the corner of your eyes when you're smiling. It was like the top half of his face was frozen. There were multiple things I didn't like about Carl right off the bat. His eyes, for one, that dead smile of his. He also never asked for anything. He tried to twist your arm. He'd very slowly try to manipulate the situation until you felt you almost owed him. Each time, it felt like a part of my brain shut down, like it slammed a door shut. It was a very clear feeling. Something about this guy is not right. Save him some food, but don't walk out into the woods to give it to him sort of thing. Something was wrong with this guy. I got along with most of the little cliques at the camp. No one really disliked each other as far as I knew. We broke off into groups based off what we liked to do in our free time, or who we spent the most time with. Carl, though, seemed to make friends one-on-one -on -one within a clique. By the time he left the group, it was decimated. They were fighting, not speaking, didn't trust each other. That's not a lot of evidence to go off of, but I'm trying to give you the picture of this man, how wrong he was. One day, everyone in camp decided to go to Fresno. We were tired of camp food and wanted some real dinner. You know, maybe see a movie or go bowling. I was the one to get off work last. Now, at camp we had this sign-out sheet. Being so close to Yosemite, we often went hiking after work. So, if we left, we had to put our name down along with where we were going. We also had to write down when we should be expected back. That way, if something happened to us, they would know to start looking right away. I put all my info down on the sheet and headed down to the parking lot. My friends had all divided into their cars. I didn't drive at the time. I jokingly asked if they'd forgotten about me. They told me that Carl had said I was going to ride with him. I looked around, but I didn't see Carl anywhere, even though I had seen his name above mine on the sign-out sheet. All the hair on my body stood on end in that moment. I was terrified to get in the car with this guy alone. He was just so not right. I really honestly don't know how else to explain it. My friends were telling me I had nothing to be worried about, though. It would be fine. I saw Carl walking toward the parking lot, a weird smirk on his face, and everything in me told me to not get in his car. I said that I was tired and wanted to stay in tonight. Carl tried to lay on the charm thick, telling me what a good night it would be with him. I owed him because of God knows what. He flashed that dead smirk again. I refused and he immediately got angry. He yelled at me that I didn't need to be such a bitch about it. I thought we were friends. The whole lot of it. I refused still. When everyone figured out I would not be persuaded, I hugged one of my friends goodbye whispering in her ear to not ride with Carl under any circumstances. Once they all left, I walked back to the area with the sign-out sheet to cross my name off, since obviously I would not be going anywhere. When I looked at the sheet, though, and saw where my name was supposed to be, my stomach dropped. My name had already been erased from the sheet. While listening to other stories of this nature, it reminded me of one of my own I had thought long forgotten. I'm a South American woman, but I've been living in the States for about 11 years now. I first moved to Colorado when I was 21, to the small mountain town of Silverthorne. I was recruited by an exchange student program for college students in South America to come to the USA work and travel during summer break in the South. 
Up to that point, I had never seen snow in my entire life, so I was extremely excited to be living in a cold, snowy place for once. I was going to be working at a very popular hotel in the town of Frisco, not too far away from the area I was living in. I lived in a hostel at the time that in itself had its own creepy stories, but I won't talk about those at the moment. That'll be for a later time. So far, I didn't actually know exactly what kind of job I was supposed to be doing in the hotel. All I knew was that I was supposed to show up there on a certain date and a certain time to talk to the owner. He was a Ukrainian-American guy that was probably in his mid-40s or so. I show up, introduced myself with the basic English skills I had at the time, and told him I was very excited to get my start working there. He gave me this weird, long stare, as if he was analyzing me. He was a very tall man with extremely pronounced eyebrows. The way he was looking at me was kind of unnerving me for a moment. He showed me to the restaurant and said I would be working there as a hostess, delivering room service orders occasionally as well. I didn't really think my English was good enough to be in such a position back then, but he still insisted. For those familiar with this area, this part of Colorado is not too far from Vale, and needless to say, it gets very, very busy during the ski season. I was dealing with customers from all over the world. Eventually, I also had to start helping out as a server during breakfast, and of course, we would get lots of orders wrong because of my lack of English understanding. The owner would get very mad about this. I remember one time that my coworker and friend was taking a bit longer to wipe down one of the tables when we had some guests waiting to be seated. I remember he just grabbed the towel out of her hand, yelled at both of us to get out and stop being so damn useless, and then slapped her in the face with it. Let me just make a small note here to say that this girl was also an immigrant like me, but with more fantastic English and having lived in the country for years. He would always try and find ways to pick fights and show us how slow, dumb, and inferior we were to him, a natural American citizen. At night, after the place had slowed down a bit, he would act all apologetic and buy us drinks at the bar, make forward comments about my appearance, and even try to caress my legs. I was starting to be very weirded out around him and would always try to not be in the same room he was. During work hours, I would be focused on customers or talking to my co-workers and would never make eye contact with him if he was present. On New Year's Eve that year, there was this big incident at the hostel I lived at. I was out at night with a few co-workers, but learned later that one of the residents had gotten way too high on who knows which drug and started chasing down one of my friends with a gun. Yelling slurs, making death threats, he got arrested, but it was safe to say that most of the people living there no longer felt quite as safe. While telling the incident to one of my co-workers the next day, old Big Boss overheard the conversation. He came over and asked if I was okay. I thought he was just being nice for once and thanked him for checking. He said I should not be staying there anymore given the circumstances and invited me to stay in one of the hotel's rooms, free of charge for the next two weeks. I could just leave when I found a new place. That seemed very generous of him, especially given the fact the hotel would be completely booked very often since it was in the peak of ski season. Still, I accepted his offer and moved in the next day. I was overwhelmed with happiness for finally having some privacy. I was sharing a room with five others back in the hostel. I was also excited to get some extra sleep before working the breakfast shift, since I was now literally living at my workplace. That was until one night later that week. I remember I was extremely exhausted after being slammed in the restaurant all day. I was ready to get cozy in my hotel room and go to sleep. I was off the next day. Around 2 in the morning, though, I woke up completely groggy and noticed that the door to my room was wide open. I could see lights in the hallway, and I noticed the silhouette of a very tall person standing beside my bed and watching me sleep. 
I couldn't see a face, but I could definitely tell it was a man. As I started realizing what was going on, I heard a metal clanking noise. I looked and saw he was getting ready to take his belt off. What the hell? I yelled out in surprise and fear. The person quickly ran out of my room. The next day, I asked management and my co-workers. I said there had definitely been someone in my room the night before, and if they knew anything about it, they said I was probably dreaming, or someone from housekeeping must have gotten the wrong room. The wrong room? At two in the morning? Housekeeping? The owner didn't comment on the case, and stopped talking to me or even acknowledging my presence after that, much to my relief of course. Nothing else happened because soon after I moved on, I got a new job, a new apartment to live in, etc. About a year after my little incident while checking the local news, who do I see on the front page? It's him, the owner. He had been arrested the night before after getting two female hotel guests way too drunk at the bar and letting himself into their room once they'd crashed for the night. They woke up and there he was standing in the room staring at them, getting ready to attack them. They screamed and called the police, and luckily they arrived in time. Was it him in my room that night? I'm 99% sure it was, but I'm kind of relieved I didn't have to find out. What creeps me out the most about this situation is, what about those nights I completely crashed after one too many drinks? You know how the altitude can affect your alcohol tolerance, and oh man, it really did for me. I remember a few times waking up with zero memories from the night before. The unsettling question is, was that the first time he entered my room? How many more guests at this hotel had had this even happen to them without ever knowing? I'm a 22-year-old woman who just moved to a small town in Virginia with my dad in October of 2015. We were having some problems with a leaky shower in the bathroom adjacent to mine. You know, typical new house problems. Of course, we called the plumber to come fix it, who arrived around 8 o'clock the next morning while I was getting ready for work. My dad let him in and apparently went down the street to gas up his car, then go to work himself, leaving the plumber and I alone in the house. My bathroom consists of just the toilet and a vanity with a door, leading into the shared shower room that connects to my dad's bathroom. While I was getting ready in my own bathroom, there was only a single door between the plumber and I. I guess he figured out that I was still in the house due to my hair dryer going off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door was thrown open and there was a toothless behemoth of a man, kind of looking like Wario and Waluigi combined into one big plumbing mess. He locked my door behind him and then walked five feet towards me, stopping right in front of me. I froze, all while he was staring at me for the longest 30 seconds of my life. He broke the stare eventually and cracked this wide, toothless grin. He started scanning me all over with his eyes, gazing up and down my body like he was sexually sizing me up. Just then, I heard the front door open. The plumber twirled around on one foot, unlocked my door, and ran out. My dad ran in after him asking if that guy had really just been in the bathroom with me. After silently nodding, my dad took off to chase after him, but the freak had already driven off at this point. Oh, and he left without fixing our shower either. My dad immediately called the plumbing company and tried to explain what happened to the manager. They proceeded to tell my dad it was our fault the man had entered my bathroom because I didn't lock the door properly. They did end up sending another plumber to fix the shower afterward. My dad told me he only returned to the house because he'd forgotten his wallet. I have no idea what would have happened to me if he hadn't returned in time. You know, it's kind of crazy looking back on it now. When I was 17, I was always in Yahoo chat rooms. 
always chatting with people I didn't even know in the local Seattle rooms. Well, this one guy and I chatted quite a lot and decided to meet up one day. When he showed up, though, it was obvious the guy had lied about everything. The age, what he looked like. The guy even admitted he'd lied about having a job. He showed up to the meeting in a bus. We started eating at a restaurant, and I said that it was nice to meet him, but I had to go. As I started to walk away, though, the man followed behind me. I walked over to a burger joint nearby. I didn't live far away from the area, and I didn't want this guy to follow me all the way home. My mom was a flight attendant and was out of town. She had about a week left until her days off from flying, so I really didn't want this guy to know where I lived when I'd be home alone for an entire week. I started telling him I had some appointment to take care of to try and shake him off from continuing to follow me. He insisted it was okay and that he would simply go with me for company. Not knowing what else to do, I stopped at a bus stop and waited for the bus to downtown Seattle. He stopped too and jumped on the bus with me. The whole ride he kept trying to talk to me, asking me all sorts of questions. I would answer with the bare minimum, in between telling some lies. I didn't really want him to know anything about me now. At one point, he tried wrapping his arms around me. I leaned away, so he tried putting his hand on my thigh. I told him I really didn't know him well enough for him to touch me. I felt sick to my stomach. The whole bus ride, I was trying to rack my brain on what the hell to do once I got downtown. How was I going to get rid of this guy? Once I got downtown, I walked over to the building where my best friend's mother worked. Since I knew the layout of the building, I could play it off and lose him, hopefully. I told him I had to use the restroom and asked the woman at the cafe inside if I could use it as well. She agreed, but I knew that there was a service delivery door that led to this hallway, and the hallway led to some back rooms that led to all the different shops, and a service elevator which would take merchandise to shops on other levels. I exited through the back door into the hallway and left the building out the door next to the docking bay. I took this as my chance to make my way to a bus stop sneakily and go home. I was going to take the express bus and get off at the airport instead of the other bus that took forever. As I made my way to the bus stop, I could see the guy in the cafe still searching for me. I managed to make it onto the bus and never saw the guy again after. However, a few nights later, I was on Yahoo Chat again when a person messaged me. I told him I wanted to see a picture to know exactly who I was talking to. He sent me one, and when I saw it, I instantly picked up the phone and called one of my friends. I started talking to him, asking him a question. Hey, are you on Yahoo Chat right now? No, why? Someone is trying to talk to me, and they gave me a picture of you. When I went back to talking to the guy online, he admitted it was not him, and admitted his true personage. He said he'd felt we had a great connection, but lost me when we went downtown. He professed his obsession for me. I cussed at the guy and told him I lost him on purpose. I changed my Yahoo name and never met anyone from Yahoo chat room in person ever again. I have a couple of creepy experiences that I can share from my third year of medical school, which is when everything is still new to you pretty much. You have no idea what to expect or how to handle some of the stuff you'll encounter. So, psych rotation at the state mental hospital, we went to evaluate a middle-aged woman with a history of visual hallucinations and some erratic behavior. All throughout most of her interview, she looked at the floor and responded slowly with one-word answers. Very flat tone of voice, clearly schizophrenic, but not really showing any of the symptoms that have brought her into the hospital in the first place. All of a sudden, as I'm thanking her for her time and about to leave the room, she jumped up and grabbed the lapels of my white coat, surprisingly hard. She got right up in my face, close enough for her breath to fog over my glasses. I didn't say a single word. I knew I must have had the most intense look of fear on my face. 
she just stared right into my eyes, breathing hard. I froze. I didn't know whether to push her away or to say or do anything. I had no idea what she was going to do to me. She held me there for about ten seconds before other staff rushed in to help. Those few seconds, though, were absolutely terrifying. The following second incident happened at a hepatology rotation, which for non-medical folk is the liver disease service, mostly alcoholics with cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a rough disease and is eventually fatal without a transplant. Alcoholics tend to not qualify for transplants in general because most of them don't want to stop drinking and many don't have the adequate social support to do so anyway. We only have a short supply of organs to give, after all, and we only give them to those who will get the most medical benefit from them. You don't want an alcoholic to get organs that could have gone to someone else, keep drinking, and then die the next year anyway, or scar up their liver from the further drinking. Most of the patients I saw were in that sort of situation. Bad symptoms, no hope for a transplant. Most of them had severe hepatic encephalopathy, as well as delirium and confusion. All that alcohol waste builds up and affects the brain once your liver can no longer get rid of it. I remember one patient who was really out of it. I couldn't even get words out of them, just grunts and moans. He surely didn't have long left in this world. The family had just decided to stop treating the disease and make him as comfortable as he could be so he could die at home in peace. I remember walking in that morning to stop and get some meds for him. Get him ready and send him home to pass away in peace. He was sitting up and eating a bowl of cereal, looking completely lucid to my surprise. Really shocked the hell out of me. He normally couldn't even control his arm movements. No way this guy could be eating cereal, let alone holding a spoon. I cautiously asked how he was doing today. I hadn't heard him utter a word the whole month he'd been there. He'd been in my service the entire time, and I'd never seen him speak. He turned to me and said in a very clear voice, I'm dying soon. I haven't got a lot of time. My jaw just about hit the floor. All of a sudden, he was back out of it again. He dropped the spoon and spilt cereal all over himself and could no longer control his body. I figured that lucidity was some sort of freak occurrence. I went to his bedside to examine him. About halfway through the exam, he stopped groaning and became lucid again. I think it's about time I get out of here, he said to me. Immediately, he slumped back into V-fib arrest. I think about that moment every time I have a dying, delirious patient. I'm always half expecting some crazy moment when they suddenly become lucid once more and call out their own death like that. I always wonder how he knew, what he was feeling that would make him say that. You encounter some truly strange things when you're working in the medical industry. I worked at a campground over the summer and agreed to do security watch on the Tuesday after Labor Day. It was completely empty all day long, pretty much. We spent most of it cleaning and repairing various items in the campground. It was also a family campground with tons of things to do. Zip lining, paintballing, go-karting, hiking. It was relatively large, approximately 50 square acres. Anyway, I'm doing security, which mostly consisted of driving around in a golf cart and making sure people weren't doing anything suspicious. That night, a motion sensor went off on the upper loop, which had been out of use since July for renovations. Usually when a sensor goes off, it's a raccoon or a deer, but we always have to check anyways. I make my way up to the motion sensor, which was constantly going off on my way up there. I logged it down on our notebook. Once I got up there, I could hear a lady's voice singing in the middle of the night. Confused, I walked around and started heading towards it. That was when I noticed a 40-something-year-old woman in a dress just walking around singing. Once she saw me, she began sprinting to chase after me. I ran as fast as I could back to the golf cart and took off down to the main office. I called the police, but they were going to take close to an hour to get out there. 
I stayed locked up in the office until they got there. I remember she chased me all the way down to the front door and screamed at me, pounding on it the whole time. When they got there, they arrested her, and we went up to the same loop where she was to look for more. I swear, looking for more drug addicts hiding in the darkness was more terrifying than being chased by her. She had been living in one of the yurts we had yet to get to for over two months. She looked like a witch, honestly. The yurt was destroyed, and we ended up having to burn it down. I used to work at this place that was part of a non-profit organization. One night, the security guard called out sick, and I was the only person available to take his place. Why this building stayed open until 10pm, I cannot possibly fathom. By the time it was 7, everybody had already gone home. The building was big and old-fashioned. All I had to do, really, was sit at a desk and watch the cameras, lock up once 10pm came around, and wait for our truck driver to come and pick up some artwork or something. It was almost 10pm and the truck driver was on his way. That was when the old elevator started to move. It was on the fifth floor, and it began to come downwards. I was freaked out now. No one was supposed to be on the fifth floor. I'd just seen the last person leave two hours ago on the cameras. I grabbed my baton and went upstairs to investigate, since the elevator was in motion. I was terrified as I was going up to the second floor. I heard footsteps behind me. It sounded like they were back down in the lobby. I rushed back downstairs, wondering if I'd forgotten to lock the front door, but it was not open. The elevator door opened soon after, and no one was inside. I thought maybe my boss was messing with me, so I started to call out his name whilst walking back up the stairs. No one was on the second floor. I continued up the stairs and heard the elevator begin moving once again. It was on its way back up to the fifth floor. When I got to the third floor, the creepiest thing of all happened. When I got to the third floor, the creepiest of them all, I heard the elevator stop just above me, and I heard footsteps once more. There was nothing on the fourth floor, and when I finally got to the fifth floor, no one was there either. I did notice that someone had placed a creepy statue at the end of the hall, though. I can't believe I had the guts to even go up and get past the fourth floor, honestly. I went back down to the creepy third floor and almost shit my pants at the sight of something moving out of the corner of my eye. No big deal, it's probably just a roach. Keep going and the truck driver will be here soon, then I can leave. No. I look again and notice the outline of a skinny person with messy hair running by the door of the president's office at the end of the hall. Oh, crap. I found some massive balls and picked them up, I guess, because I began to move toward that area. The elevator started moving again, and there were footsteps in the staircase at the same time. I really started to freak out. I wanted to cry right there in the hallway. I had no idea what to do. I ran into the meeting room and hid near the windows, because if I saw somebody skulking about in this building, I was just about ready to jump out him. I heard the elevator doors open on my floor, and someone calling out to me softly. Hey, hey Jess. I yelled for them to leave me alone. The footsteps got closer to the meeting room. The door opened. I didn't look up because I had my eyes closed. I grabbed the baton and was about to swing at the person. When I stopped, it was the truck driver. I was so relieved to see him. He got me all cleaned up and helped me close up as well, then gave me a ride home. I have no idea what was going on that night, but seriously, screw that place. I never worked another security shift there at night again. A couple of years ago, I was sailing on a ship that maneuvered offshore looking after a pipeline that ran offshore about a half mile long. As the ship was unhooking from the pipeline, 
the line that was used to hold the ship to the pipe's connection got wrapped around a person's leg. It sucked him through the rails, and he fell about 30 feet into freezing water. The general alarm sounded for a man overboard, which woke me up at around 5 o'clock. I was all confused, waking up only to find everyone frantically running around on deck. Once I realized this was no drill, I ran to the starboard side. There were three life rings in the water, and one was about three feet away from the man overboard. He couldn't reach it. He had a work vest on that was keeping him afloat, but I could clearly see that hypothermia had set in already. He was moving slow and weakly calling out for help. At this point, it was clear that he wasn't able to grab the life rings. Half the crew and I ran over to the rescue boat to unhook it, while the other half tried to get him onto the ship some other way. It seemed like it took forever to get the rescue boat down. The hold-down straps were rusted and took a hell of a lot of effort to get off. The cover was all wrapped around the boat, and it was impossible to get off as well. The hoist was the slowest hoist of all time in that moment, which seemed to take ten minutes. It was all too slow. I was sure this guy was going to die. We finally got into the water. We got two guys in the rescue boat, and we started to take off towards him. Of course, everything that can go wrong did, and the engine cut out. Luckily, we were able to get it started up again, but at that point, I ran back to the starboard side. Everyone was yelling and panicking. Where is he? Do you see him? One of the mates said. It turned out that somebody had lowered down a ladder and he'd managed to grab onto it, but his leg was still caught in that line. We couldn't get it free. The line got tugged and he got sucked underneath the ship. At this point, everyone seemed to go silent. I looked down and saw the man's boot floating up toward the surface. A guy walked up to me and said, He's gone. After a few nerve-wracking moments, the crew in the rescue boat continued to search anyway and radioed that they'd found him further along, bobbing in the water face down. Still attached to the hoist line, he was unconscious and not breathing. At this point, the rescue crew tried pulling the guy onto the boat. The swell of the sea impacting his chest made him spit up water. The crew radioed back that miraculously he had regained consciousness the line was removed from his leg, and he was pulled fully into the boat. The boat headed straight to shore, where a beach crew and ambulance were waiting. They got the guy some coats and put them on him. He was conscious enough to understand what was going on, but he could not speak at all. The ambulance took him, where he was sent to the ER for extreme hypothermia and near drowning. The guy's vest ended up saving his life in more ways than one. It kept him afloat and kept him visible. I say kept him visible, because if you blinked in those conditions and he didn't have that vest on, we probably would have never seen him again in that water. Things luckily did not result in his death, but they easily could have due to the temperature of the water. With all that equipment failure and how fast of a reaction time you have to have, it was the scariest thing that ever happened to me while sailing. The look of terror on the guy's face is still with me to this day. That feeling of being absolutely powerless to help, even though he was mere feet away from us. He spent a few days in the hospital after, and miraculously suffered no serious injuries, if you don't count the near-death experience. I was on a cross-country road trip with a colleague. We were driving through West Texas on a major highway in the area. Where we were, even the major highway was pretty desolate though. There had been a truck stop or gas station about every hundred miles, and every single one of them was solitary. No other buildings in sight, there weren't really any towns either. The exits were just places to get to more gas stations to get to the next gas station. It was a pretty late night. We had been driving for about four hours. I can usually drive for about eight before I'm tired, but my friend could only drive for about four or five hours before she was done. Before it was my turn though, we were getting low on gas, about a quarter of a tank left. 
when you travel the road often, you learn to fill up when you get the chance, cause you never know what might happen. She was looking out for a gas station as we drove along. It's really corny, but we were talking about fate and destiny and some other weird stuff at the time. That sort of conversation gets me keyed up and worried, so I was trying to change the subject. She took an exit whilst we were talking, and I got out my coffee mug so I could fill it up during my turn for the driving. We pulled up into a typical middle-of-nowhere gas station, just a simple station and the trailer out back. I assumed that that was probably where the people who owned this station lived. There was another car parked out front of the doors off to one side as well. We got out still talking and walked up to the double doors, each of us grabbing a door handle. Well, it turned out the door was locked. I turned and looked around to see if there was a sign in some place, you know, be back in 20 minutes or something. I noticed several things in succession. The coffee maker inside was about halfway done brewing a fresh pot of coffee. The monitors that showed the store were visible from the outside. All of them were showing, and there was a splash of bright red on the door in the back of the place. On closer inspection, I suddenly realized I was looking at a huge streak of blood with handprints in it. Every hair on my neck stood up at once. My friend began shaking the door, yelling that we needed to get some gas. I had already turned and started walking away though. We have to leave now, I said to her. I grabbed her arm and started propelling her back into the car. I now noticed the other car in the lot had no plates on it. It was dingy and had multiple dents. There was also an empty gun rack in the window. I ran into the car, dragging her with me. She seemed to take forever to open her door and get in. The whole time she kept saying we needed some gas, while I tried to explain to her that I'd seen blood. After what seemed like a year, she finally pulled out. When we were backing up, I saw through the windows that the back door of the gas station was now open. We pulled away before I saw anyone come out, thankfully. I was completely freaked out until we were about 20 miles away down the highway. I tried to call the police, but I didn't get a phone signal until we had driven about 40 miles and got to another truck stop. Again, not a town in sight, just a single building on its own, out in the middle of nothingness. I called the cops and they thanked me for the information. I never heard any more about the incident. But to this day, I feel like if I hadn't freaked out in that moment, we probably would have met the robbers, or whoever it was in the back room of that place. I wish I'd been able to find out what the hell happened there. It was a station somewhere in the western part of Texas, within about a hundred miles or so of the signs for those places on Route 10. I've never been able to find anything about it though. I was in Tesco, the generic wholesale shop that we have here in England. I was just innocently browsing the DVD section on my own. I was looking at the new releases, not paying too much attention. My friend's parents were always on holiday, and she was having a sleepover girls' night at her place. She'd asked me to scope out some scary horror films for us to watch. Whilst looking, I heard someone say to me over my shoulder, Oh, so you like movies, huh? I turned around and saw this random guy who looked to be around 70 years old. He had real greasy hair, but what struck me the most was that he was wearing socks and sandals. Yeah, that kind of made me smirk. I looked at him and just said yes, then proceeded to carry on down the aisle. He followed after me and started talking about all the films he'd seen, what I should get, etc. I just replied, yeah, okay, whatever. I was reaching the end of the aisle without having found anything I liked. I'm a woman who's 23, by the way, but I must have looked much younger, I guess. I didn't have any makeup on, and I have dark, long brown hair. The guy was still following me, asking me where I was going, if I had a boyfriend too. Would I call him if I was alone? That was it for me. I turned around and looked him dead in the eyes. Piss off, you hillbilly pervert! I walked off further into the shop. 
I picked up some ice cream and some popcorn and was now going out to my car. I started driving to my friend's place, singing along badly to the radio. I'm not sure how long it had been there, but suddenly I noticed a silver pickup truck taking the same turns as I was. I was only doing around 50 in a 70 area, and they could have easily overtaken me if they wanted to, but they just stayed right behind me. My friend's turn passed me by, but I could take the next turn and double back on myself through the back roads. I didn't indicate, something I regret now, and realized that this was very stupid. I took the other turn and drove back as fast as I could to her house. As I did, I saw the car take the same turn as me. She lives in a cul-de-sac area. I parked my car down the road not far from hers and ran into her garden. She always kept the gate open, and I didn't know how long it would be before she'd open the main door, so I chose the garden instead. I locked the gate behind me and knocked on the back door. After being let in and being called a weirdo and a peeping Tom, I got handed a stern warning. Not a minute later, though, there was a knock on the door. My friend opened it. It was the creepy guy from Tesco with his silver car parked in the middle of the road. He was standing there saying something along the lines that his daughter's car had broken down and she'd run up from her house along this street. He was here to pick her up. Was she there? He described me exactly and what I was wearing. My friend said that no one like that was here and shut the door in his face. She then locked it up tight. I hadn't told them about the creepy guy yet. I had only just gotten there, but she knew there was something off about him right away. We watched through the curtain as he went over to every other house in the cul-de-sac. He would get turned away and then move on to the next one. We later found a piece of paper in a plastic sandwich bag left on my car windshield. It said, where did you go? I wasn't finished with you. This happened fall of 2017. My sister Gigi was in high school. My parents took a trip out of country, so I was going to be in charge of my sister temporarily. I lived in my parents' house while doing so. I took her to school, picked her up when she was at her friends' or boyfriends' houses, and picked her up after her church meetings as well. I was told she started going to regular church on Sundays with her boyfriend and his family. I was happy she was getting into it. We grew up Catholic but didn't often go to church after we moved to the USA. She was also going to another church at night with a friend of hers. I grew up with Sunday Mass and that's about it, so the thought of spending extra free time and going back to church was quite weird. If she wanted to grow up to be an extra religious person though, who was I to stop her? On Monday, she went to school and hung out with her boyfriend. I picked her up from the boyfriend's house, no big deal. Tuesday, she went to night church after school with her friend. I was told that she would get a ride home from her friend's mom. She was supposed to be home at 9pm, but she came in a little bit late, around 9.40 or so. I asked why they were nearly an hour late and she said they were preparing for a retreat of some sort that Saturday. Seemed like an alright excuse, and I trusted her, so no big deal. Wednesday through Thursday was mostly normal. One day, she went home after school and we hung out. Another day, she hung out with some friends. One of these days, she was hanging out with her boyfriend and some friends, and she asked me if she could go to church. This would be the second time going to night church in this week. I remember thinking when I was in high school hanging out with friends, it did not cross my mind to spend free time at the church instead. They ended up not going, which relieved me a little bit. At this point, I was starting to get weird vibes from this night church. Friday, the day before the retreat, her plans were to go to church after school and come home at 9pm. My plans were to hang out with some friends and be home before then. I was driving home a little late and texted her to not worry her. I received no reply though. I waited for a bit and texted her again. No reply. 
I called her and there was still no answer. At this point, I was hoping she was already home and for some reason went to bed early, but when I arrived, the house was empty. I kept calling, texting, calling, texting. I started to really panic. Around 10.45, two hours after she was supposed to be home, she called me and said they were still at church, preparing for the retreat. She wasn't allowed to have a cell phone turned on. I normally try to be the cool older brother, but I lost it in that moment. Not towards her, but this was getting to the point where it was getting concerning. I'm coming to get you. Text me the address. I don't care what you're doing. I'm coming to get you right now. I got a text with the address, and I drove to pick her up. I was able to calm down a bit once I'd heard her voice, but I was getting more and more pissed at the same time. Once I got there, some lady was outside waiting for me. She said sorry for the trouble. They were preparing for tomorrow, and that's why Gigi was still there. I said that was all well and fine and all, but I was in charge of her for the week, and our parents wanted her home by 9pm every day, so go and get her right now. She told me that Gigi could not come out right now. The sermon was not over yet. At this point, I really started to lose my patience. You bring her out right now or I'm calling the cops for kidnapping. I'm her legal guardian and she's under 18. This sparked a real fire under the feet of the lady. She walked inside and invited me in as well. Do you want to come inside? You're welcome. I said to just go and get my sister. The lady walked inside and a moment later my sister and the lady emerged. The lady was giving my sister some documents and a shirt, as well as some information about tomorrow's retreat. On the car ride home, I was trying to choose my words very carefully. That was when my sister suddenly turned to me and said, I don't want to go to the retreat tomorrow. Can I stay home and say you aren't letting me go? I said, yeah. Turn me into the bad guy. I don't care. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. It turns out that everything until that night had been normal church things, but tonight they turned it up to 11. There were people yelling, throwing up, they were feeding people something weird that was causing this, and the smoke in the air smelled funny according to my sister. I kept asking her if they fed her anything, but she said no, they weren't supposed to until she went on her first retreat. They said they'd pay for her, making it seem like they were generous. It was supposed to be an initiation, commitment to the place, according to my sister's friend, who'd already gone there once. They give you something that makes you sick, representing the evils that are leaving you, and you feel sick for about a week or two. The people there that night were scary, and didn't look right in the head. I read all the stuff they handed my sister, all culty stuff. The place looked like a house that was made to look like a small church. I also later found out from my aunt that this church name did not make sense from a Catholic point of view, and they weren't listed or official. When I was a young girl, maybe seven or eight at the time, I went shopping with my mom at her beloved store, Hobby Lobby. I remember the day very well. I'm in my upper 20s now, and I even still remember the shirt I wore that day. I remember it made me feel pretty, but now that shirt is stained in my mind. My mother took quite a while to shop normally, and I liked looking around myself, so I would not stay too close to her. We lived in Colorado Springs at the time, so it didn't feel unsafe to do so. I was somewhere in the middle of the store, looking at some random things. That was when I looked up and noticed that someone was giving me direct eye contact. Now, I'm very polite and unassuming, so I smiled in a friendly way, and that person smiled back. I didn't really think anything of it. I moved along looking at some other things, when I noticed once again that he was fairly close behind me. I decided to go down an aisle near the back of the store to look at some stickers, still not alarmed quite yet. While walking down the aisle, I saw that once again the stranger was following behind me. It was at this point that I realized I was in the corner of the store and it was not too well lit either. 
I was all along with an older man. I felt the intense need to go back to my mom right now and get away from him as soon as possible. Unfortunately, this encounter was far from over. I scurried back to my mom who was deep in thought about whatever craft she was doing. I thought at first I would be safe now, and I wanted to inform my mother about what happened. As I looked around, I saw the man staring at me from only a couple of feet away. At this point, I began trying to rush my mom out of the store. I didn't know how to tell her without the man overhearing what I needed so desperately to say. I was so shy and unsure. I wanted to act natural like I wasn't onto him, but obviously looking back, I would handle it much differently now. My mother continued to roam the store, all while this man followed us around. One might wonder why my mom hadn't noticed. Yes, it is a little neglectful on her part. She was just that kind of mother in general, always focused on what she wanted to do at the time, not too concerned with the outside world. The classic kid with her face in the book, the man was unwavering in his eye contact and proximity. What was truly terrifying, though, was how brazen he was being. I continued to rush my mom, pleading with her to just hurry up. We ended up at the fabric section of Hobby Lobby. If you've been there, you know they have these giant rolls of fabric. My mother and I stood at one end of the rolls. At this point, the guy knew my mom was not paying much attention, so he stood facing me at the other end. I tried to get away from his gaze by moving to the other aisle between the rolls, but he just followed me. He did this over and over again. I was starting to panic and begged my mom to take us home. We finally started walking away towards the registers. I didn't see him following us at this point. We were checking out and I continued to look back and forth around for him. Finally, we grabbed up all our things and started to leave. Right before the exit is where I saw him again. He was staring me down. I'll never forget the complete look of disgust and anger on his face. I would not exaggerate by saying that I saw the devil that day. Pure and utter evil intention in his eyes. I knew he was angry because whatever perversion he had on his mind had not been fulfilled. I was truly terrified at this point and started crying and rushing my mom to the car. I told her everything in a hurry while putting the items in. Before we left, I watched for him to make sure he was not following us out. I didn't see him again. I cried for a while to my mother and she explained to me that I could have told her before and she would have involved management. As I stated earlier though, I didn't want him to overhear me and I was not old enough to really understand. I'd never been taught how to deal with that kind of situation. Looking back, I think he wanted to kidnap me. He was fairly unrelenting. I wonder at times if he had slipped me out back, if I would be alive today. I have a little girl of my own now, and I do not let her out of my sight. I remember once I lost sight of her in the Halloween store for all of two seconds and absolutely lost my mind. It's so strange when that sort of thing happens to you, because in the moment, it never feels as serious as it is in hindsight. I'm living in Japan right now, and my family met me in South Korea last month for a vacation. I've lived in Japan for three years now, and this was my second time visiting Seoul. The first time, I found myself in a bizarre situation. My family and I were touring a famous palace in Seoul. The grounds were pretty vast, with at least a mile or two of walking required to cover the whole thing. About halfway through our visit, we took a break and sat down on the edge of one of the structures. A German tour group was coming in through the same passage and paused there for a few minutes so the tour guide could explain the history of that particular area. A bunch of German people took seats all around us, along with one Korean guy, who we thought nothing of at the time. After all, we were in Korea. After a couple of minutes, my family and I decided to move on and head to the cafe near the entrance of the palace. The tour group had obviously stayed behind, 
but one guy got up the same time we did. Yeah, the one Korean guy. We didn't realize until about five to ten minutes outside of that area, but one of my sisters pointed out the guy had been following our path very closely, enough to be very suspicious. By the way, it's worth mentioning we had seven people in our group. Me, two of my sisters, my mom, my dad, my uncle, and my brother-in-law. We definitely had the power and numbers thing going for us. My family is also incredibly confrontational when we need to be so. After my sisters and I noticed something weird was going on, we stopped walking, and the man immediately stopped too. We all gave him a very obvious stare down, to which he responded by looking very intently at the ground. Strange, but okay. We decided to carry on, and again this guy decided to follow. By this time, the rest of our family was catching on as well, so we decided to make a stop near one of the gates that led to the main part of the palace to see if he'd stop again. Sure enough, he does. He sat down on the ground trying to make a play as if he were doing his own thing. We gave it another minute or two to look like we were having a conversation before moving along again. You guessed it, the man stood up immediately. He tailed us right to the center of the main palace building, where we stopped again. When we saw he was still following us, this time there was not really anywhere natural to stop and take a seat. Instead, he just kind of stopped in place a couple of feet away from us. At this point, there was no way anyone could deny he was straight up stalking us. My dad and uncle turned right to him. Hey buddy, is there a reason you're following us? Maybe the guy couldn't understand much English but I think the sentiment was probably very obvious. The guy didn't even try to respond, wouldn't even make eye contact with them. He was just silent, staring kind of dead-eyed at the ground. My sisters and brother-in-law and I decided at this point that we needed to find someone who worked there. There was nothing inherently threatening about this guy, but something about him was very eerie. That's beside the fact that he'd been stalking us overtly for over 20 minutes at this point. There were no guards or staff in the immediate area, so we all picked up the pace. The guy, of course, picked up the pace right behind us. We headed over to the cafe once more. My brother and I got there first and found a staff member at the counter. We told her what was going on, and she seemed to understand immediately. She went to get her supervisor from the back. By the time the staff member and her supervisor came back, the guy was now in the cafe with us. I pointed him out to the two staff members. That's him. The guy again didn't make eye contact whatsoever, but obviously the jig was up. He power walked his way out of the cafe and back onto the grounds. The staff member followed him out and talked to my sister and mom to let them know that if we had any more problems with this guy, to let someone know immediately. It ends kind of anticlimactically, but that's the last we saw of him. Thankfully, the staff were quick to react. With how they acted familiar with him, it kind of made me wonder if this guy had a habit of stalking tourists on the palace grounds, or if this was a regular thing perhaps. We realized after the fact that he must have been following the German tour group beforehand. Maybe he thought we were also a group he could blend into, but while seven people is definitely a large number, it's not large enough to go unnoticed especially when we were all a single family. Obviously, we were going to question the presence of a new member. In the end, my uncle and I kind of assumed he was probably just trying to be a perv, trying to get close to an exotic foreigner. I've been stalked in Japan in similar ways before, and my uncle who lives in Asia said similar things happen to women where he lives, but never in a group setting like this. I guess we'll never really know the man's true intentions, but I'm glad we'll never cross paths with him again. This particular story takes place over the span of a year. At the time, I was probably about eight or nine years old, living with my mom in a small apartment. My grandmother lived in the apartment below ours, we lived in the middle of a not-so-great town, but I loved being outdoors. I had a lot of older male cousins who lived with my grandmother on and off, 
and they would come out to keep an eye on me for the most part while my mom was busy. I don't remember a whole lot of the details, but I think it was sometime during summertime. I went next door to my cousin Leia's house to play. They let us out to play alone for some reason, which I wasn't technically allowed to do, but I figured that I wasn't technically home and that was a home rule. While we were in the alley behind our apartments, an older boy, probably about 15 to 16 years old, stumbled right up to us. Even now, I remember the immense smell of alcohol that radiated off of him. I froze in my spot. The teenager started to wobble back and forth and began screaming in my face. Where is my money? I told you I needed my money! This guy was screaming at a child some nonsense about borrowed money. I was absolutely terrified, locked into one spot. I was crying. Leia came to her senses first and yanked me away by the arm. We took off towards my grandma's house, which was much safer than her own, since there wasn't really much supervision on her parents' end. The whole time, the boy just stood and stared at us as we ran off. We tumbled in through the back door, crying and telling our entire family. My cousins decided to scope out the area. The kid was not found, and I didn't give the best description in the first place, being young and terrified. My mom even took me part way up the alley where we had suspected he came from, but he was either hiding or had left already. They were unable to identify him. Leia ended up spending the night at our house. Cut to bedtime. We were in the bathroom brushing our teeth and goofing off. We had a tiny bathroom, so the toilet, sink, and window were pretty much crammed into one corner. Suddenly, there was someone screaming in my backyard. Because of the town and area I grew up in, we assumed it was a fight between my neighbors and my cousins or something, or maybe just between my cousins themselves. Both happened pretty frequently. Being the little gossips we were, we turned straight to the window and settled ourselves in to look. Only, it wasn't any of them. It was the drunk teenager from earlier. He was waving something in his hand, still screaming about the non-existent borrowed money. When light finally hit the object he had been brandishing, Leia screamed. He had a gun. Immediately, we dropped to the ground, screaming and crying, unable to form coherent sentences. My mom swooped in and shut the blinds and ushered us down to my grandma's, where everybody erupted into chaos. The whole night was spent giving statements to the police, calling uncles and generally trying to calm Leia and I down. We were in absolute hysterics. The guy was never found, and life was fairly normal after. My teachers and principal were informed of the situation when school started beforehand, but nothing prepared me for the day mid-fourth grade year when I walked out of elementary school to find this boy and his friends sitting across the street. They weren't technically on school grounds. I tried to justify it. Maybe he had little siblings, or maybe he was just hanging out, but I knew in my heart he was waiting for me. I tried to walk home, but as soon as I would walk in one direction, he and the group of teenagers would match it from across the street, till I shifted directions again. They would follow suit. Not even a block from school, I made the executive decision to bolt back the way I came and tell a teacher. All hell broke loose again. More police came. The kid was smart, though. When I ran, he'd taken off as well, and he was again not found. My mom started picking me up and dropping me off to school after that, so things quieted down a bit. There were still times, though, when I'd be looking out a window alone, when I would see him standing across the street, just watching me. The last incident, I never even connected to this situation, until years later. He had stopped showing up at my school almost as abruptly as he'd started. I eventually begged, pleaded, argued, and cried enough for my mom to start letting me walk home with Leia again. In hindsight, that was a terrible idea, but I was a really spoiled kid. One afternoon, I split off from the group of kids that Leia and I had been walking with and headed towards the apartment. Because it was an apartment building, 
The entrance was set up kind of odd. The first door you entered basically just led to a second door, which then took you to a hallway, where directly to the right was my grandma's apartment door, and straight ahead was my mom's. When I approached the entrance, I noticed the first door was already open. Okay, whatever, it's not that unusual for my cousins to have left it open. I stepped in, took two steps forward, and went to open the second door. This door was open as well. Now that was weird. I didn't know why at the time, but my grandmother used to be adamant about shutting that door because my older cousins smoke weed and she didn't want the neighbors to smell it and call the cops on them. I ignored it and continued walking down the hallway. I reached my apartment door to find it standing wide open. My instincts finally kicked in and I bolted. Nobody was at my grandmother's house at the time, so I never got to go up and check the apartment. No signs of forced entry, nothing being stolen, nothing even rummaged through. I can't prove it was him. Hell, we didn't even think it was an option back then, because he'd finally left me alone. Only my mother and myself had the keys though, and if it had been my cousins breaking in, they would have stolen something, anything of value to feed their addictions. The door had been closed and locked up to the point of my grandmother leaving earlier, so it was not an accident, and it was not a forgot-to-lock-the-door scenario. 